Well, welcome you to the regular council meeting Wednesday, December 9th, 2020, uh, which is being held virtually. Uh, you can view it on Rogers TV channel 53, I believe. And uh, I believe it is our, uh, actually, I, I guess it's not actually showing on there. We have a conflict or may have a conflict, but you can certainly watch it through streaming, uh, Rogers streaming. Um, so I'll call this meeting to order and ask if there are any declarations of uh, conflict of interest. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ross. Yes, Your Worship. I will be calling a conflict uh, with regards to uh, committee to whole item 8.1, uh, the introduction of the island princess cruise boat and request a dock and sail from Midland Town Dock. Um, my conflict has to do with, um, I'm actually, I didn't do any business since 2020, but I have in the past uh, with the their competitor, which would be the Miss Midland. So uh, I just wanted to make sure, uh, side on the uh, error on the side of caution and uh, declare that conflict. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. At the, uh, I, uh, please provide that documentation to the clerk and at the appropriate time, just if you'll move from the, away from the conversation. Appreciate we'll it. Th thank you very much. Uh, seeing no others, I will... Uh, Read the uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, the town of Midland recognizes that it is located on land which is the traditional traditional and treaty territory of the Anishinaabeg people, now known as the Chippewa Tri Council, comprised of Bosley First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Island First Nation. This territory is within the Pre Confederation Treaty 5 and Treaty 16 and included within the Williams Treaties of 1923. The town of Midland recognizes that it is located on land which is the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat and the historic homelands of the Metis, and that our town is home to a large and diverse community of Indigenous peoples. Uh, I'd also ask um, uh, Council and the audience to join me in a moment of uh, silent contemplation. Thank you very much. Uh, I have here a motion moved by Council, Councillor Main, seconded by Councillor Prost, that the contents of the regular Council agenda of December 9th, for December 9th, rather, 2020, be approved. Uh, comments or questions from Council? Seeing none, all in favor? Thank you, that carries. Next, we have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Ross, seconded by Councillor Cunningham, that the items and related recommendations contained within the December 9th, 2020 consent agenda as consent items having been considered by Council be adopted with the exception of item 5.4.1 CSR-2020-45 Midland Point Road, consideration of construction methods which will be considered under section 10, reports and other items withdrawn from the consent agenda for council's consideration. Uh, Council, you've heard the motion. Any comments or questions around? Councilor Gordon. Thanks, so it was just, um, I guess in relation to, well, first of all, I'm kind of shocked nobody pulled 543 on the, the CAO's 100 day plus report, but um, fair enough. I won't, I won't do that now. But the, uh, just a comment on the letter from the Georgian Bay Snow Riders that's subject to a, um, a motion further or a, whatever it is, or an approval later on. I just had a question because in reviewing it, I wanted to know if there'd been any discussion on the Georgian Bay Snow Riders with the Georgian Bay Snow Riders about grooming that new multi-use trail section between Midland and Penetang this winter because neither municipalities are planning on servicing it. Um, and I know I said this at the last meeting, and it could be a cost-effective way for the trail to remain accessible all winter at really no cost to either municipality. And it didn't form part of that. And I was just wondering if maybe that never got mentioned or if they said, no way, Jose, or if you just can't do it. Um, 
So just more of a question. I don't object at all to that item. Um, Mr. Campbell, if you're there, could you comment on that for Councillor Gordon, please? Uh, through your worship, uh, it was Mr. Barrio who was in negotiations and discussions with Georgian Bay Snow Riders. Uh, so I don't know if he had those discussions with him. Uh, I know on just in general on some of the other trails, their equipment is quite large uh, and may not be appropriate for that, but we can put that question back to Mr. Barrio and he can answer it at a later date. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, I saw Deputy Mayor Ross's end up. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Thank you, Worship. I did want to make a comment with regards to uh, 5.4.2, uh, which is a 100-day plan. I know there's quite a few financial impacts with regards to that, and I just wanted to have insurance that uh, we're not making by approving this today that th this is not a pre-budget approval and uh, that the final decision will be made at uh, the budget table. Mr. Deneau, do you care to answer that, please? Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to uh, Deputy Mayor Ross, yes, I can assure you that uh, any recommendations that we would bring forward that would be that would have financial impact would be done through the uh, budget process. Thank you, Mr. Dell. Uh, Thank Deputy you very Mayor. much. Thank you very much. Did I see somebody else's hand up uh, earlier? Did I miss? No. It almost looks like uh, Mr. Deneau is at the University of Guelph by the Arts Building, but may maybe not. Um, so, uh, Council, you've heard the motion. All those. That's our, sorry? That's our beautiful downtown library that Mr. Deneau is behind. <laughs> That's twice in this term of right council. Up. On that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, that Councilor Main, you wanted to speak. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just on, um, just a brief comment on the report back uh, from uh, Mr. Seo, uh, Mr. Deneau. Um, I Just great, it was a great read, uh, very uh, uh, poignant report. And I think that it really addresses uh, uh, some huge concerns that we're having is how do we achieve all the things that we set out to do when we got hit with this pandemic curveball? And so it's, I think it's very uh, important. Uh, he really highlights uh, sensitivity towards uh, getting through uh, the rest of the pandemic. And I really uh, I agree with the reassessing the strategic uh, plan and seeing what we can achieve before the end of the term. Um, you know, I, I like the idea of a governance review. We just went through one. So uh, as long as we engage with the committees in terms of updating their terms of reference, that's uh, all uh, good. And I think that it also touches on uh, how we try to find a balance between volunteer and staff and how we use committees as a tool to help us uh, with good feedback on policy. And so, I mean, we look forward to all, a lot of these ideas uh, and um, fully support uh, reviewing the strategic plan. Thank you for uh, putting all this together. It was very, uh, very poignant report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I suppose before I, I actually call for uh, the vote, uh, may, maybe let people know that a number of the reports uh, in here, one in, was included a, a report on Great Lakes cruising. Uh, there was the CAO's 100 day report, Midland 2021 finding a wave, which basically outlines a number of actual items for the senior leadership team and the corporation over the next uh, two years. Uh, an annual development charge activity, uh, which is a, a, an update or an amendment to the development charges uh, bylaw. The report that speaks to that. There's an interim tax levy bylaw, which allows the town to levy taxes uh, until such time as the budget is uh, approved. Uh, Huronia Museum line of credit for 2021, which involves municipality supporting the museum until their revenue stream is sufficient to cover. Uh, Georgia Bay Snow Riders Club Agreement, which allows Georgia Bay Snow Riders access to trails and lands within the town of Midland. Uh, investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Public Transit Stream, which is a transfer of payment agreement. It's a housekeeping bill, which allows us to deal with the Crown on that matter. Um, request for part lot control, 
exemption uh, for uh, 808 Birchwood Drive. Um, and that is a follow-on from a public meeting, which I believe uh, held we held uh, at the last council meeting. So just bringing that to completion. And finally, the um, council committee calendar for the year 2021. So um, you might want to download that so you know what committee meetings are occurring when in 2021. And with that, I'll again ask uh, the question uh, all in favor of the motion. Thank you, that uh, carries. Now, at this juncture, I normally have a uh, motion to move into um, committee of the whole. I don't have that here, so. Um, Your Worship. Yes. Through you, I uh, somehow the motion ended up on my desk, so I'd be happy to read it for you if you'd like. Please, and thank you. Uh, moved by uh, Councilor Gordon, second by Councilor Darrell, the uh, council resolve into the Committee of the Whole. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Thank you, Deputy oh. Mayor, it's all yours. Now, normally I would um, take over from here, but uh, the first item uh, is uh, deputations, and I have a conflict with regards to that item, so I'll turn it back to your worship to uh, handle 8.1 and 8.2. I'm going to turn off my uh, video uh, and I'll turn it back on when the deputation is over. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So actually, the first next item was presentations. There are none. We're now into deputations, uh, sorry, deputations and petitions. 8.1, uh, introduction of Island Princess cruise boat and request to dock and sail from Midland Town Dock in the spring of 2021. Ms. Kathy Tate will be addressing council on behalf of uh, Georgian Shores Catering State. Good evening, Mayor Strathern, town councillors and staff. Can you hear me now? Certainly can. Oh, yeah. thank you so much. So uh, thank you for allowing us to present uh, this evening. I am in the office here, the Chamber of Commerce office with Wade Plews, who I'd like to introduce you to, as well as David Schofield. Hi, everyone. If you haven't uh, had the pleasure of meeting them in person yet, you may indeed have enjoyed some of their um, catering at Georgian Shores Catering. They are the owners of Georgian Shores in Midland. Um, so over the past year and a half, uh, since they've opened Georgian Shores, they've certainly proven themselves as being uh, savvy business owners and uh, have a, a big following in town now. Um, so uh, we're, we have exciting news in case you haven't heard it, Georgian Shores Catering, um, these two gentlemen have purchased the Island Princess, the boat cruise, which currently is situated in Aurelia and will be brought to our region in the spring of 2021. To give you some scope on the boat, if you're not familiar with it, it's 66 feet long by 27 feet wide. It draws five feet and it accommodates up to 200 passengers. It's, it's similar to a paddle wheel style, style uh, vessel, kind of looks like that. And the first deck is used for dining. So the planned sailing schedule for next year, um, the boat will begin sailing on around July 1st, once uh, painting and maintenance is done um, to it in the early spring. And daily cruises are planned seven days a week through until Thanksgiving. The schedule will uh, follow something like a lunch cruise every day, an afternoon sightseeing cruise, and dinner cruises on uh, specific dates as well. Uh, Georgian Shores, of course, will be working with private groups, weddings, um, corporate groups to do the catering and things like that. So earlier to this meeting, we did meet with uh, Town of Midland staff, including Nicole Major and uh, Rick, the, um, the harbor master to talk about this proposed uh, proposal and uh, hopefully having the boat dock in Midland. And they've indicated that there is a space uh, should the Miss Midland want to stay in her current location. Um, there is a, an alternate space, which is over towards the ADM mill. And um, Rick has indicated that that would, would certainly be suitable for a boat of this size. Um, they've also noted that a laneway would be needed in order to service the boat and um, there would be an upgrade needed to the, the power in order to service the boat in that, in that area. So in terms of projecting the number of visitors after some market research, we are projecting from 25,000 to 40,000 passengers 
for 2021, that's considering that it would be a late start for the boat. Normally it would start somewhere around the May 2-4 weekend. And um, even if COVID continues to be an issue and there are restrictions, um, we still feel that that is achievable. So somewhere between 25,000 and 40,000 passengers, um, significantly uh, impacting the, um, the tourism economy, I think in Midland, we would agree. So the Chamber of Commerce, uh, I'm here, the Chamber of Commerce is here because we've taken on an administrative role um, for the boat cruise. I come from the boat cruise industry um, and it's just ideally suited that we take over administration, uh, marketing, promotion of the boat, staffing. We will hire someone dedicated to selling tickets and we will have a ticket kiosk right inside our Chamber of Commerce office at the bottom of King Street. We'll manage the phone lines um, and pretty much take over all the administration and sales of the boat uh, on a public basis for 2021. So um, thank you for, for listening to this. Um, realizing the benefit to the town and the region and the tourism economy, our request, um, and, and David and Wade will talk further about this, but our request to council this evening is firstly to approve the docking of the Island Princess at Midland Harbor for the 2021 season. And secondly, to approve the docking of the Island Princess at no fee or for 2021 only at a signif significantly reduced docking fee, considering this is a brand new venture um, and hopefully a partnership with, with uh, the town of Midland. So that, uh, that is uh, an introduction to the, uh, to the boat crews and um, our partners here, Wade and Dave, and uh, I'm not sure if you have further well, you've, you've covered a lot of it uh, very well. Hi, everyone. Nice nice to meet or see all of you. Um, I'm David. This is Wade. And yeah, so we're really excited about the boat. Um, you know, I used to be a part owner of the Boathouse with Kirk and George. Uh, we're already working with them uh, with ideas. And, you know, it's just it's going to be a partnership to create a lot of business for everyone in town. Uh, you know, the more people who get a piece of the pie, um, I am fine with that. So it's not a it's not a conflict. It's it's not a competition. I want everyone to to win on this. All businesses, hotels, uh, etc., bed and breakfasts. Um, you know, so that's um, everyone's a colleague. No, there's not competitors. So, yeah. so uh, any any questions you have? In, uh, no, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, so you guys you, pretty much. Yeah. If okay. you have any questions. Then... Yeah, we want to make a lot of money too for for the town of Midland, and you know, um, theme nights, yeah. we have a lot of theme nights. We also plan on making um, uh, drawing attractions when the boat's in dock. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, Halloween haunts. Uh, you know, yoga and martinis like, yeah. on the on the on the boat. You know, we have a lot but of using ideas. other businesses in town. Yeah, with yeah, and letting other businesses in town uh, profit from that. Right. Especially including all the restaurants. Wait. Yeah, please go ahead. I think I had his hand up there. So we Muted decide. again. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, questions for the presenters? Uh, I see Councillor Gordon, then Councillor Main. I think you guys get the prize for the uh, the shortest deputation pitch that we've ever had, at least in my term. Uh, short and sweet, <laughs> no PowerPoint uh, fumbles or anything like that. It's uh, right on. Short and sweet. Thank you. So uh, what I don't see on the agenda tonight is a uh, motion that follows this. I I I, oh, do you? Perfect. Um, because this is great. I mean, it's a welcome idea. It's tourism. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you about all the, bestow the virtues of this. I think it's fantastic. It's risky, but all the risk is yours, man. And uh, we, we should do everything we can to help you guys out. Um, to give you, a, you know, the best chance at, you know, launching something like new, like like this in a semi post COVID world. So good on you. Uh, from my perspective, I mean, we haven't got to the options yet, but I would be content to see no dockage fees for 2021, and simply consider it like a seed grant, sort of in kind, to give you guys a leg up, because uh, it's not like we're giving you free land or something or a building that somebody would normally pay for. It's space that no one's ever occupied or you know for a long time. Um, but we'll kick that around, I'm sure. And then possibly do the electrical improvements on a cost recovery basis, because we don't really want to put the rate payer in the hole. So if it's, you know, whatever, four or five grand or something to run the hydro you need to plug in, uh, wherever the improvements are, you know, I'd love to see that from staff. And then you maybe look at doing some, you know, whatever you guys need, if you can do it as a, a 
capital spend up front or you want payments across. I'm, I'm prepared to be completely flexible with you guys. I think it's awesome. It'd be love awesome. to have that in town. And uh, as soon as I have my shot in the arm, I'll be there, uh, you know, enjoying the adventure. <laughs> So well, thank you for right on. Questions. I don't. I don't have a, really any questions. Just uh, unbridled enthusiasm just, and support for you. This is a long-term thing too. Like uh, for, the, for the cost part, I mean, we plan on being here for a whole long time. So um, if that helps with yeah, the upgrades and what have you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Councilor Gordon. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Councilor. Uh, next, I have Councilor May. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the deputation. Um, thanks uh, for the idea. It's a fun idea. Uh, really, I guess now comes down to the uh, question of logistics. Uh, we have lots of big boats trying to access our little town uh, town dock. And so uh, we always had Prescottan. Uh, Miss Midland is, uh, from what we hear, is probably going to come back up and running. Maybe not next year, but certainly is has always been a, a fixture. And it's certainly, like you're saying, it's not one or the other. Um, this is really a question for staff about logistics, about do we have the capacity to host? Because I think you mentioned that we might even, you guys would be put at a different pier. Was that, were you guys mentioning that in the deputation? You're not looking at docking at the town dock. You're looking at one of the piers on the P. Patterson Park. Yes, yes. So after meeting with Rick um, and Nicole, they indicated that the um, the dock over towards the ADM mill, this would be a brand new dock not used for this purpose before. Um, but that was on kind of the thought that the Miss Midland may still want her spot. So they, okay. they indicated it would, be, it would can't, be suitable. We can't use the spot Miss Midland was at anyway. Um, uh, and for the record, we tried to purchase the Miss Midland, so we didn't want to do the game of capitalism. But um, uh, <laughs> Half what you hear, all what you know. Um, so it's it's uh, but that part of the dock is better because it's 27 feet wide, so it has to it can't be where the misfit was anyway. So, um, yeah. Well, and, uh, just the, I guess the question for Mr. Campbell, I guess on logistics is um, what's the time frame of being able to set this up? I said I think there was a, a reference of putting a laneway in power, uh, and there's an ask about uh, dockage fees. Um, so just. Uh, curious about what's the what's the total ask that we're uh, uh, pondering here. So Thank this you. The core, Mr. Campbell, uh, goes to answer that. The, the motion that I'll present momentarily. Okay. We'll pass it back to staff for building on the comments of the deputation and looking at the various options, cost associated, etc., uh, in a report. So that we'll ask the staff to come back with that. So we have it in a. a, a recorded form, then, then we can act, act on it. I think that's the most prudent way and it saves Mr. Campbell trying to do all the sums in his head here this evening. It's got, okay. I think he's got a few other things. I well, appreciate on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions for the uh, Councillor Downer? You're muted, Councillor. Well, you, you almost had it there. Flip back. <laughs> okay, sorry. You're good. I have a bit of a problem. Uh, you know, if the Miss Midlands coming back and we offer uh, these gentlemen free doggage for a year, how do we close the door and not offer it to Midland, uh, Miss Midland? I mean, that's just a no-brainer. <laughs> you not think she'll be at the table? I think so. I think that's probably something for that will be in the report in terms of what do, normal dockage would look like. So was it a question for us? Uh, what's no. being foregone implications of SAP foregoing, as you've just mentioned, to anybody else coming in? Do you open the door for another ask? That sort of thing. I see. Okay, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll I'll stay tuned. Thank you. Yeah, I thought I, I think we all will. It sounds like a great opportunity. The question is, what are the details of, from a the points that you've made, others have made as well. Any further comments for the deputants? Seeing none. No, the, just a, just a, as far. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just sorry, just as far as <laughs> as the boats, they are two completely different boats. Um, uh, one's one's a promenade, kind of like the Serenity Deputy, but higher out of the water. And Miss Midland is a, a totally different tours. So it, it, it is. Uh, they are different businesses. Um, just, just think, to reiterate, there'll be uh, colleagues, not uh, competitors, in our mind, and we will be offering different service, different routes altogether. We, so. we actually used to do the food on, on the Miss Village, so we're quite friends sure. with Jim and that. But, uh, okay. 
So I'm sure that will all come out in uh, the, the, uh, the staff report. I'm going to read a recommendation here, handing it back now for a, more, a little more formal uh, embodiment of the detail. We'll come back to council, and I think you've heard some enthusiasm here, so not to prejudge it. but um, So I have a motion moved by Councillor Main, seconded by Councillor Prost. As further to the deputation provided by Kathy Tate, General Manager, Southern Georgia Bay Chamber of Commerce, and Wade Plews and David Schofield, owners of Georgian Shores Catering, at the December 9th, 2020 Council meeting. Council recommends, the, recommends excuse me, that the request to dock the Island Princess cruise boat and sail from Midland Town Dock be referred to administration with a report to be brought back to a future meeting for Council's consideration. So any comments on the motion from uh, Councillor Gordon. I know we don't like to put our, our staff under pressure with times and dates, but um, given the fact that they'd like to make this happen in the spring and we are in, deep into December and there's holidays, uh, what are the likelihoods of getting a report back, you know, February per se at the latest where that, you know, assuming things work out in their favor that the whatever works have to be done are done and they can count on advertising and getting their business spun up for the spring, uh, a spring time launch. Yeah. Assuming that they're talking about doing it next year, I'm, I maybe I missed that. Well, I think they are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Your Worship, uh, yeah, uh, Miss Major started uh, discussions with, with this group uh, earlier in the fall, so we already have a head start. We were planning to bring a report in January. Uh, some of the information tonight uh, was new to me, yeah. so we'll have to consider some of these financial aspects. But hopefully, we can get a report together for January. And there are, and whatever, because after that, there'll be resulting budget implications potentially that we need to talk about in February. Councilor Gordon, you okay with that? Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, very much. Uh, any other discussion points on the motion? Seeing none, then I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you, that, uh, that carries. And thank you very much. Uh, it's, it sounds exciting. The, uh, thank uh, wish you. you, thank you, thank you so much. Wish you all thank the best. Great time, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you. So we're, okay, 8-2, Principles Integrity, a recommendation report of the Integrity Commissioner respecting complaints against Councillor Gordon, December 2nd, 2020. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey A. Abrams uh, and Ms. Janice Atwood Petkovsky, uh, co principals of Principal Integrity, are to speak to the report. I would ask the people, uh, either Mr. Abrams or Ms. Atwood Petkovsky, uh, to help me through this process because, uh, having done it a couple of times, I, I, I do have seniors' moments and tend to forget the protocol. So, not um, a um, if you just help me with that a little bit. Yes, I definitely will. Um, I will be speaking to this report and I'll just give some high level comments at the outset and uh, leave you with the recommendation. And um, Jeff uh, will not be joining us this evening. Uh, we work together on these things, but sometimes we spell each other off so that somebody sure. gets the evening off and we uh, tend to have a lot of evening meetings as you can appreciate. Sure. Um, so, um, as much as we enjoy being with you, and we, we really do enjoy your company, um, uh, we don't take any pleasure in bringing these reports to you. This is uh, one of the uh, other duties as assigned, not our favorite uh, part of this um, uh, endeavor that we serve you in. Um, I did have uh, some preliminary comments that I wanted to make. Councillor Gordon provided uh, some uh, documentation uh, regarding uh, the uh, optics or potential of a conflict of interest with respect to uh, the members of council who um, filed the complaint. And so I, I guess I will speak to uh, that right off the bat. Uh, if Councillor Gordon is uh, uh, inclined to have me address that, um, I kind of look to you. Normally I, yeah, okay, thumbs up. So um, Councillor Gordon presented um, cases and uh, a bit of an argument, and it's a novel argument that um, the council members who filed the complaint, we have 
basically complaints from three members of council. Uh, and the argument goes, well, those three members of council um, may have a conflict of interest and so should not be uh, entitled to participate in this uh, consideration of the report before you tonight. Um, and it's an interesting uh, approach. It is a novel argument. Um, our, our view is uh, flatly, there is no conflict of interest. So let me explain why. Um, it's possible that one might perceive some bias and I'll get to that. Um, the legislative framework was established so that members of council, whether they filed a complaint or not, uh, can participate in the council consideration of the matter. And in fact, I would point to, to the Education Act, uh, which applies integrity commissioners uh, to uh, school boards and trustees, which uh, contemplates actually at the outset, and it's been modified through protocols, but contemplates that complaints can only be initially brought by trustees. Um, and in fact, there have been protocols previously in uh, municipalities where only council members could bring complaints against fellow council members, and that's largely changed over the past decade. Um, certainly the Municipal Act, and um, again, even the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, contemplates that um, there's no restriction on complainants who are members of council participating. In fact, in 2019, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act was amended to clarify that the member who was complained about can participate in the meeting. So clearly underscoring that all members of council are entitled to participate in the meeting. Uh, the only qualifier on that is that the member who was complained about can't vote on his or her own uh, sanction. But they can certainly participate and um, it would certainly be odd if the member about whom there was a complaint could participate, but the members who made the complaint couldn't. But um, with respect to uh, the optics and, and it's, I guess, something that is a bit of a novel argument. If there is anything, it might be um, an optic of bias. And so um, as we know, and as we provide in our training, uh, when um, a member of a body uh, considers all of the material before them and is open to uh, looking at that uh, and not embedded in a position, then that dispels any notion of bias. And we would suggest that uh, we are appointed as your, in this case, investigator for these matters to bring you uh, our findings. And so you have before you our findings report. And so long as all the members of council uh, give consideration to the findings before them, that would dispel any optics of bias. It is, it, it, I do thank Councillor Gordon. It's an interesting uh, argument uh, to have had to consider. Um, so our view is clearly uh, no member of council has a conflict of interest, neither Councillor Gordon about whom the complaints were made nor the councillors who or the members of council who brought those complaints forward. Thank you. Could I ask one question? Ms. Potovsky, is that uh, Absolutely. okay? Absolutely. Gordon. Thank you very much for considering those arguments. Um, uh, I must say I'm a little shocked because I thought the Supreme Court rulings were, you know, would trump everything else. But uh, at any rate, I, I accept your, you know, your wisdom on this. Um, I do right now, or just a minute ago, you'd mentioned that councillors that uh, can't vote on their own sanction. Um, and I do recall my first kick at the can, you know, my, my errant email, um, saw the advice provided by either uh, yourself or Mr. Adrams that I wouldn't be able to vote on the final outcome. Uh, then the next one of those was uh, Councillor McGinn's where there was a financial sanction. My, sorry, I should add my first one was just, you know, uh, not a financial sanction. Then Councillor McGinn's, which was a financial sanction, which clearly put her in conflict of interest, so she couldn't vote. And then we moved to Councillor Oshevsky's, where again, just like this, my first one and this one is a non-financial sanction, and he was advised that he could vote. And what you just 
said, unless I misheard you, is that I would be precluded from voting on mine. And I'm just, I'm a little confused. There seems to be a, a disconnect. I was told I couldn't on the first and watch Councillor Shevsky vote on his. And then I believe I just heard you say I wouldn't be able to participate or at least vote on this one. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, clear that up for me? Yep, that uh, through the uh, mayor. Um, I don't, I'm trying to recall whether we advised Councillor Ochevsky that he could vote. Um, I don't think we should have. If we did, we misspoke. Um, but um, in any case, um, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act uh, makes a clear provision for the member to participate but not vote on the sanction. So. But do you entertain a comment or question from Councillor Shevsky? Sure. Councillor Shevsky. Here's what you Thank mean. You very much. Yeah, it's, I tried the space bar thing and it didn't work this time. It's always when you're on TV. So it's my recollection uh, when I was asked, uh, did I have any uh, declarations of pecuniary interest? I tried to declare a conflict at that time. Uh, I was corrected that um, not only was I able to participate, but uh, I was advised by principal's integrity that I was able to vote at that time. I did refuse to vote um, at the time of voting just for my own personal reasons, but I was advised to vote. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, through the mayor, I, I can only apologize. That was, uh, it's possible that uh, I misspoke at that time. I'm trying to cast my mind back. I'm sure the meeting is somewhere archived. Yes. Um, and, uh, it's a relatively new amendment. It was implemented in March of 2019 and perhaps I misspoke. I, I do apologize if I did. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure if anything turns on it, um, but the best advice is that the member can participate in the discussion, um, but should not vote. So particularly though, I would think uh, where there's a sanction involved but in oh, any case, clearly. Yeah, but, no, that's fine. I accept it. No, no worries. I just wanted to call that out because it seemed like a disconnect in my memory. So I, fair, I, fair enough. Thank you. If I misspoke on that one uh, back when that report came forward. I wouldn't have voted on this anyway. I just was more the principal of it. So very good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, so, and I, I just, uh, I, I guess, uh, to reassure those counselors who filed the complaints, there is no, in our view, there's certainly no conflict of interest and we don't think it's supported in, in the case law in any way. So um, I want to then give some high level comments. And again, we don't go tooth and nail through the report. Uh, we um, did the investigation and um, so we like to think that the report speaks for itself. So I will just highlight a few things. Um, we did have uh, complaints um, and the complaints um, essentially allege that um, Councillor Gordon is uh, disrespectful and um, bullying and harassing um, occasionally and in a sort of a pattern uh, with respect to uh, fellow members of council and um, occasionally with respect to staff. And then there was an allegation with respect to exerting undue influence regarding a developer. We did not find undue influence with respect to the developer, although we did clearly find that Councillor Gordon is um, what we would characterize as um, getting out of his lane and getting into staff's uh, work. And that's really injecting himself into uh, matters uh, where he should not, where he should be working with staff rather than um, putting himself in that direct situation to be uh, circumventing, if you will, staff process. Uh, with respect to the allegations of disrespectful and disparaging comments. We certainly found there were examples uh, and we've laid those out in the report. Um, Councillor Gordon has candidly acknowledged that he's not always um, as statesmanlike uh, perhaps as uh, 
uh, might be appropriate. And um, some of the examples um, Councillor Gordon indicated come from private conversations. Well, um, we uh, find that um, addressing colleagues with uh, really thinly veiled um, hostility or contempt is quite inappropriate and name calling is inappropriate. Um, name calling is really a way of um, devaluing input or contribution without addressing it directly. And so it is quite undermining. And um, disrespectful comments, uh, holding others in contempt and uh, advising them of that is, um, it is bullying, it is harassing behavior, which no workplace really could condone. And I guess one of the things we wanna say is we're not really the etiquette police. It's not our goal is to be the etiquette police as the integrity commissioner. But we think that this kind of behavior, uh, which appears to be a pattern, and I would hasten to add, it's not what we looked at uh, going back over a year in terms of um, uh, allegations regarding Councillor Gordon. It's certainly not to that degree, but it is corrosive. It erodes goodwill. It undermines um, the collegial environment. Um, and it's not that everybody has to be a team, but it's certainly uh, inappropriate to be treating colleagues to those kinds of um, undermining and harassing comments. So um, again, we did not find undue influence, but we certainly do find that Councillor Gordon is um, undermining staff. And when he sets himself up as the go-to or sets himself up to be directing or involving in an activity such as discussions with the developer to resolve an issue without staff, he is setting himself up as the go-to and this can be uh, really problematic. Um, it certainly circumvents staff's involvement. It's certainly contrary to the council staff relations policy. Um, again, uh, we don't recommend uh, any um, monetary penalty. We think that it's uh, sufficient to have a formal reprimand on the record, that it's behavior that's inappropriate. It's very divisive, uh, clearly, since the three complaints came from colleagues on council, it's unfortunate and divisive. And there's certainly opportunities to, um, to improve. Those are my comments, and I'm uh, happy to answer questions. Can't hear. You're mu muted, Your Worship. I didn't use the space bar this time either. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for your comments. Uh, I'll open the floor for questions from council around clarification to Ms. Spatovsky. So I have uh, Councillor McGinn, then Councillor Main. Is there any mechanism that is put in place? And so that's question one related to number two, where mediation happens first. And if it did not, is there any mechanism in place? And if, if people, nowhere do I see that multiple people decided to get together and say, you know what, let's see if we can talk this out. I understand that it's the right to come to you. Um, 
But instead of going this route, moving forward, is there a better way? Is there a means that we don't have to go through this? I understand that this is your job, we've hired you, but it does cost taxpayer dollars. And I'm not happy about that. Um, is it reflected anywhere? I'm sorry, I apologize for looking off because I'm looking this way at screen. Is it reflected anywhere that I have missed that there was an attempt to have a conversation and seek to understand each other prior to coming to you? Ms. Podolsky. Uh, so just generally, um, we do encourage informal resolution and we uh, typically will ask complainants, whether, whether they're as a council or whether they're members of the public, we will ask whether they've talked to the counselor, whether they've made any attempt to communicate or whether they would uh, why that. Um, certainly where it's three members of council um, who certainly know each other and have presumably ample communication amongst each other. Um, we are on a matter like this, we would expect certainly that they um, were reaching out to us because they felt they had uh, attempted unsuccessfully to get matters corrected. Follow up, Councillor. You're on mute. Then. You're on mute. There you go. There I am. Okay. Um, so I, I'm looking at it, and uh, it, I mean, it's a very, it's a very long report, and I've read through it a couple of times. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but does it clearly say in here anywhere that um, my fellow peers attempted as a group to get together? Um, and prior to coming to you, um, seek to find a way to create a solution and build us as a council, uh, for lack of a better term, work family. Is there somewhere that I am missing that that option was chosen? Again, I understand it is our right to, to utilize your services and thank you for the times that you've been extremely helpful. I'm just, I guess what the point I'm trying to drive home is that I, I really, I, I want us to be working together and I don't see in the report that there was an attempt at mediation or understanding and a group meeting. Just clear, I understand you support it, but am I missing that it did or did not happen? Um you are not missing it. It's not set out in this report that that did or did not happen. I, however, uh, of course, you're sitting amongst your fellow councillors and I'm sure the message is not falling on deaf ears. May I, may I just make a comment here? Thank you. <laughs> on page, um, where is it now? Page four of the report, there was an attempt by Councillor Maine as I understand it, Councillor Main reached out to have a dialogue about decorum, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the response, that was our response, I understand was shared with some councillors who, given the nature of the response, I'm not sure why they would bother. Did you say page four to clarify? Four. Well, it's, I printed page four, yeah. It's item, item 18, 18 okay. and 19. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I didn't follow proper procedures to interrupt you, I apologize. That's fine. Um, so, who else did I see? Councillor Main, and then Councillor Prost. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, in all honesty, this has just been incredibly embarrassing, and it's just a huge uh, nuisance and a distraction from all the stuff that's going on. Um, Ms. Atwood Potofsky, I just wanted to ask you a question. Uh, since your findings were made available last week, um, there, is, there was some additional concerning behavior. Uh, public statement, Councillor Gordon, when asked about it by media, here we go, oh my God. Um, he says, uh, these three councillors are weaponizing the code. Uh, they're using against me. Uh, they're, they were sitting on evidence for months. 
uh, it, basically, they're out to get me, especially Councillor Maine, and he uses the expression that we're out for a pound of flesh. Uh, I guess assuming that we're seeking um, financial uh, sanctions. As a teacher, as a person who's talked about as the code of contact, you don't consider yourself a referee, but a teacher uh, or a coach. How do we go from here as a learning opportunity um, moving forward? Um, I think everyone is saying we should be filing more informal uh, code of conduct complaints, but what do we do with this code of conduct? We'd love for everyone to adhere to it. And going forward, um, we, um, we just really uh, have some concerns that we may see additional code of conduct lapses. So through the mayor, that's an excellent question. Uh, and it's, um, it's a challenge to all members of your council, I think, to lean in and try to rebuild or build uh, for, the, for the first time a very positive relationship. Uh, we recognize that it was off to a rocky start right after the election. Uh, there's been some water under the bridge. You probably do have an opportunity if, if folks lean in, frankly, to mend some of those uh, feelings and mend some of those bridges. Um, one of the things that we say to folks in training is when um, you're addressing uh, others, whether it's your colleagues on council or the staff, sometimes think of them as your boss instead of you know, those to whom you can, you know, your subordinates, um, not even as equals, but as your boss to whom you owe some uh, level of respect and authentic respect and recognize that many people have different perspectives and views and we do see some very uh, challenging examples in the media of political repartee. It doesn't all uh, you know, reflect the best kind of uh, behavior and statesmanlike demeanor. So I think that there's always room to aspire to that highest level of engagement and as we said in the report, it's, uh, it's important to, to try to demonstrate authentic respect for other people's perspectives and views. We all do have our own perspectives and views and you certainly all do and you bring something to the table. But I mean, that's really the educational pitch, I guess, is, is there's an opportunity to turn the page and move forward together and uh, we would certainly uh, encourage you to all play your role there. Councilor Main, follow up. Well, just to follow up, um, I mean, we truly want to move on from this and maintain a professional relationship. And I, I would still argue that I maintain a professional relationship with Councilor Gordon. If he emails me about affordable housing, I'll reply promptly and give him the answer that he's looking for. Uh, it's just a question of the code of conduct and training. We've gone through training. This is uh, now the second code of conduct issue. At what point do we need to require additional um, uh, code of conduct training or perhaps um, a re review or strengthening or refinement of the existing code of conduct? Thank you. Um, through the mayor, uh, we, are, we would be happy to provide you with additional training or come in and um, spend a couple of hours with you, I think post COVID would be more effective. Frankly, we do some training via Zoom, but it's, I mean, you can see how two dimensional it really is. Yes, we have a conversation, but it's really hard to um, have that same, uh, I guess it's all about the relationships, isn't it? And it's so difficult to achieve that. So what we're saying to some of our uh, municipal council clients is uh, hold off on additional training where you want some specific matters dealt with until 
hopefully post COVID, we have masked up and gone in and done training in a couple of municipalities in large spaces, but it's not quite as uh, effective, but we certainly can do that. Um, uh, I'm not sure revision of the code is necessarily in order. This is a, a fairly robust code that's now in place uh, with the town of Midland and it's um, the same code as is in place probably in you know, four or five dozen municipalities around Ontario. It's, it's a pretty good code of conduct, we think. Um, the components that we're looking at in these matters, in all of the matters, really, are components that exist in virtually every code in Ontario uh, at this point. So maybe not verbatim, but they're pretty much the same provisions across the board. I would, again, um, underscore that we had some issues way back regarding um, comments that Councillor Gordon had made. And um, we feel that this is not that. This is simply that sort of um, low grade continuous uh, behavior that can be corrected. This is, I guess on a scale of one to 10, this is not 10 or 11. It's something that's not difficult to correct. It's a question of uh, comments to colleagues. And so hopefully this is something that's achievable. We would love to see you, but we would certainly love not to be seeing you for these things. Amen. Councillor uh, Cunningham. Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. Councillor uh, Councillor Prost was next. My apology. That's okay. Thank you. Um, so much has been said. Um, I respect the integrity commissioner's um, decisions. Uh, I just don't think that we should even have come this far. I truly think we're all adults. We need to speak to each other. It's not a secret that there's bad blood in this council, but I think we're all capable of showing respect. We have to have mutual respect or we can't do our job. Our job is to be here for the public to take care of the matters at hand, our Midland Bay Landing. We gotta worry about money. We have to make decisions. We're here to do a job and there's no reason I could see that we can't do it at the table together. I would just love to see some mutual respect and conversations. And if we can't do them, if certain councillors can't have those conversations together, then maybe there needs to be, you know, maybe somebody from the town sit in on that or another councillor. It doesn't matter what the history is, but the history keeps repeating. And it's, this isn't good for our town. It's not good for what we were elected to do. I would love to see this end. And I'm going off because I'm really upset by this. This is my first term and I do love it, but it's very frustrating. And I actually like each and every one of you, not that it matters. And that's my point, it doesn't matter. We need to work together and respect each other. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cunningham. So I uh, appreciate the commentary uh, from Councillor Prost. There will be an opportunity for each of us to speak. Uh, and I'll again offer you the opportunity. Uh, but this is more about, from my, my sense of this, is it's uh, questions for clarification about process or uh, interpretation from Ms. Potowski. So Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I truly appreciate this report and your language around recognizing that it is milder and there are improvements and that there is, uh, this is not a, a 10 or an 11, whether we rate it or not. I appreciate that. And I think your findings are correct. And I agree as well with Councillor McGinn and Councillor Prost about this mechanism and looking for that. I was looking for that as well in this report. My question actually is more around and it may be a, a training question, but where the error in working of, around the developer occurred. And I asked this question because I've had developers reach out to me and actually I've sat with Caitlin 
um, actually his worship and myself have both had opportunities to meet with Caitlin, uh, with ADM Milling. Typically it's a conversation where they're clarifying, they're asking some questions. We don't typically have staff with us in those conversations. We've had conversations with residents around um, Midland Point Road and the goats on um, over on Vinden Street and where at what point that becomes an error and I suppose it's the connecting to staff or bringing it back to council and I think there's a huge gray wide line there of where we're facilitating a conversation and helping people feel heard and understand what the concerns we're hearing from residents are. So when um, Caitlin reached out, they wanted to know what concerns had I heard from residents? Um, what concerns um, could they be worried or thinking about that would um, be cogent and listening? So where that wide line is, and I understand the, that after that saying, and I brokered a deal, I get where that would be over the line, but in that wide gray area, where do we really fit? So that, that is a, there is room for gray in that area for sure through the mirror. Um, in our view, this fell not in the gray, but over the line. And that is, um, for example, um, the, uh, the counselor should have at the point that it was getting into uh, negotiating what it would take to solve the matter should have engaged staff at that juncture. For one thing, um, there may well be circumstances that the counselor would not necessarily be aware of where a, an individual developer, perhaps not this developer, but an individual developer might have other matters on the go where the staff might wanting to be prioritized, prioritizing other matters where there may be other issues even in the same subdivision that need to be dealt with. And the counselor may or may not have that knowledge in their frame of reference. Uh, so it is problematic where any counselor, you know, steps into that role of staff. They should at that moment, they don't have to every time they speak to a developer or um, another business in the community engage with staff. But at the, at the point that it turns into um, brokering a deal or negotiating a solution, et cetera, um, it should be involving staff. Thank you, Ms. Potowski. Does that answer your question, Councillor? Yes, thank you. That was maybe what I, I think it's clear. I think there's still some chances for interpretation that would mean you know, reach out to staff uh, err on the side of looping in staff as early as possible. I was asked a question today about uh, what I'm going to do about the Prime Minister. I said, I think you're talking to the wrong person <laughs> and directed them to Mr. Stanton. Um, any further questions of clarification from Ms. Potowski? Councillor Gordon and then Councillor Main. Oh, look, Councillor Main, go ahead. I just basically going to thank her for the report. Go ahead. Councilman. Oh, I was just about to ask about um, the findings. It was talking about how you found that there was four uh, breaches of Rule 9, 10, 11, and 12. Mm -hmm. You've talked on that, so we don't really need to get into specific uh, what each one of those rules are, but uh, I just wanted to ask uh, if any one of those is um, uh, not more important than the others, but if there's anyone that really stood out to you that of these rules, this is the one that uh, we really are focusing on uh, as a learning opportunity. Uh, through the mayor, I guess it could be distilled down to two simple rules. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you and stay in your own lane. Very succinct, well put. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Gordon. Thank you very much. That's a very uh, nice way to boil it all down. Um, anyway, I just wanted to thank you again. Uh, I have had many conversations with you, not just because I'm the subject of a, of a few complaints this term. I think it's we're up to four now. 
but uh, also seeking your, your advice, uh, which I follow, I try to follow religiously. And uh, just what a wonderful, it, it really is great working with you guys, um, both of you. Uh, you know, I find you the one the hardest to get things by. You're maybe more of a stickler when it comes to things than uh, Mr. Abrams is, but I think you have a good balance in the team there. Um, and you've also given me some good advice and, and had me uh, reconsider some positions that I've, I've taken during our interviews. So uh, I just want to thank you about that and then let people know that, you know, I don't begrudge um, the process whatsoever. Uh, I don't begrudge people using the process, although I, my personal opinion, which is, you know, well on the record now, I don't believe that it's for counselors to use. This is a mechanism for the public who normally has no ability to, you know, do anything about errand counselors until election time. But that being said, there's nothing that precludes counselors from using it. So my, that's my personal opinion. And I've shared that, but uh, I do want to thank you for the report. I do take a little bit of issue with um, continued language of being bullying and harassing, uh, but you know, whatever, I'm not gonna argue this. Uh, I, I understand and perhaps I have different definitions of that kind of behavior, but Sorry. I know it, when you look at it specifically, um, even one communication that's unwanted and unwarranted can be, can be deemed that way. So I, I just wanna thank you for the report and uh, the thoroughness is that you usual show, usually show in it and for considering my arguments about the conflict of interest and bias. And I guess the time for me to speak to uh, the other stuff is the next part of this. So anyway, I, again, I appreciate it and uh, appreciate the input and the discourse that we're having right now. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so Ms. Potofsky, at this juncture, I would offer each of the councillors an opportunity to speak to the report and the recommendation and I would offer Councillor the Gordon, Councillor Gordon rather, the opportunity of rebuttal or not. Uh, certainly, his position vis-a-vis -vis the report. I'd like to limit everybody's conversation to five minutes, uh, just in the interest of a rather heavy agenda. The report's pretty clear. The recommendation's clear. Um, does that fit within the regimen of this type of process? It does, Your Worship, it does. Thank you. So I'll, I'll start off with uh, Councillor Gordon. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, give, I'll give everybody five minutes uh, if, you, if you need a couple, uh, half a minute more or whatever. I'm not going to be a stickler. Uh, but I, we do have a heavy agenda. It's pretty, the report's pretty clear. So I'd just like to get people to speak to it. Uh, I'll start with you and then I'll move around the screen as I see the screen in front of me. Um, so, Councillor Gordon, please. All right, thank you. You'll be happy to know I don't have a big, long-winded written speech prepared for tonight, as I sometimes do. Um, I figured this is a little simpler. Um, let me cut right to the chase. Uh, uh, Councillor Maine, I apologize for calling you a snowflake or suggesting that your behavior is uh, like that of a snowflake um, in that communication, just for everyone, because there's all kinds of different versions of it going around there. Uh, just the context, which I think is important, not doesn't offend it. Uh, was that uh, there was a email that began from another uh, counselor requesting something happen that wasn't possible, their procedure bylaw. I joined in saying I'd be happy to champion it. Um, it, uh, you know, Councillor Maine, as he does, uh, likes to give me advice on things and, you know, I'll, I'll give him credit. He reaches out without hesitation usually and actually he's quite long-winded when he gives me the advice. Uh, and we got back and forth into a discourse. This is just before the pandemic was declared back in March. And I was having some concerns and expressing concerns with him about maybe some lack of decision making and some unwillingness to, um, you know, take some steps that I really strongly believe were important. And that's when I uttered the now infamous snowflake uh, statement when I shouldn't have. Uh, I should have actually told him, you know what, Councillor Main, I are. You know, John, as we were talking, it's a personal communication on a Twitter PM account. I should have just said, John, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not actually going to say what those things are because I don't want to be insulting him now on television. But I should have used the actual words rather than wrapping it up in snowflake. And I think, you know, he may have not been happy with my position that I was taking with, you know, my observations about him. Uh, but it was a, I would probably be rather called to the carpet for, you know, using those kind of words, which I think were repeated in the newspaper. Um, rather than snowflakes. So, John, I'm 
you know what, we can disagree on things. We also work, I think, well together. Uh, I don't have a personal axe to grind with you, but I would like to put into context some of the statements that I made about having little to no respect for some of you and some of our senior staff. Those are all quoted in the report. I just wanna, first of all, I'm not gonna deny that that is the case or mostly was the case at the time, but the context is that was like two weeks before my hearing for the lawsuit and uh, the matter had still was in the air about whether it was gonna be settled or not. I was faced with you know, probably 30 to 40K more dough to go to a hearing. And so right in the middle of that, we're about to have the pandemic slapped on us and I'm dealing with that stresses and the, you know, where am I gonna get the money for this and that and the other thing. And all of a sudden I get a lecture from John telling me not to advance a motion, let staff lead, da, 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 da. And it culminated in me just basically, you know, saying, you know what, forget about this. And I got snippety with them. And I also told her, you know, expressed my opinion that I didn't have a high opinion of some of the folks in here because of the financial costs that I was incurring and my integrity being dragged through the mud for the past year. So I pretty had a low, honestly, guys, I had a pretty low opinion of a lot of you guys who voted to sue me. So that manifested itself in this email exchange. And then, you know, when John tried to have a sidebar with me in good faith to, you know, to tell me what his problems were, I uh, rebuffed that uh, with the snowflake comment. So for what it's worth, that's the context. That's the time uh, when it happened. Uh, that's what I was thinking. I'm not making excuses for it, but I think context is important. This hasn't happened over the pandemic. We've been working great, moving all kinds of things forward. Uh, you know, is it a pattern as it's being characterized? I would say no, because otherwise it would be happening all summer and still happening. Um, the, con the, the discourse in the newspaper, well, I'm, I'm, you guys know me. I speak clearly and bluntly. I try not to beat around the bush. Uh, I have, I've ceased using vulgarity, which is actually in my normal vernacular when I'm not on camera. Uh, and, you know, that's me. So, you know, sorry, I, I'm not going to be sp statesman like 24 seven. I, I, I'm trying. Uh, I thought Snowflake was so low on the spectrum that it wouldn't raise any ire. And quite, quite frankly, John, if you'd contacted me after going, you know, that was offensive to me or said anything like that after our comments, and we haven't talked since basically, that's since March. I would have immediately apologized and retracted that for what it's worth. But so I'm sorry, didn't mean to offend you. And I haven't mean to make you a, a mockery or, you know, have you ridiculed publicly, which seems to be happening from, you know, this report. So I don't mean to add fuel to that fire. So I just want to un unequivocally apologize, John, and, you know, not, not my intention to continue this. Okay. Um, I do need to share that, uh, you know, Deputy Mayor Mike Ross has reached out to me since then. We've talked and agreed to put this stuff behind us. Hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn, Deputy Mayor Ross. And, uh, you know, there's a guy that I don't talk to you much. You see him at the odd event. Um, Councillor Downer, I, I think the last time I talked to him, I had a beer with him after a council meeting like almost a year ago. So, I mean, we, we don't talk. I mean, not because we don't talk, but we just don't. Um, you know, not, he didn't approach me ever about any of this stuff. And in all fairness, neither did uh, Deputy Mayor Ross indicating that they were, you know, deeply offended by this or were having problems with me. Um, I would have happily entertained those phone calls or emails because I so rarely speak to them. Um, so I was a little taken aback when I saw effectively carbon copied complaints with just new names and signatures at the bottom. But I understand where they're coming from that uh, collectively they wanted to support. I'm, I'm making assumptions. You guys can speak to this on your own but wanting to support Councillor Maine and obviously have a problem with some of my abruptness and maybe the, the way I am. But to some degree, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm very clear that I, the way I've been behaving and the way I am on council, the things, my opinions, the things I bring forward are entirely mine. It's me, it's the way I've always been. Um, you know, that's, that's not a great defense for someone who said, you know, was convicted of beating their wife or something, but that's not the case here. This is just me being a little non-statesman-like, maybe being a little gruff and, uh, you know, maybe being the fish that swims upstream on a lot of things. But I campaigned on doing that. And uh, clearly I was unhappy with a lot of things that happened in politics. Some of you guys were in that council that I was deeply unhappy about. And when people told me, well, if you don't like what's going on, why don't you run for council? So I did. And I guess it resonated with enough people and lo and behold, I got in. So. 
I'm not I'm gonna not gonna sell out on my ideology or the, my reasons for being here. And I think we work well together on most things. Clearly, we're not gonna see eye to eye on all of it. Um, the things that we do, I think it's magical and wonderful. We're, we're moving forward on, and there's gonna be things where we just don't. And that's the way it is. And I'm gonna continue to work with you guys regardless of uh, what's you know what's happened in the past. I can't quite forget it. It's still pretty fresh. I'm still uh, you know paying for it, but um, at the same token. I can put that behind me and work with you without us all being buddies and chums. Uh, it's lovely when that happens, but it doesn't need to happen for me to be able to work with you. And so I commit to continuing to work with you for the remaining of my two years. Uh, we'll see what happens after that. And uh, try not to be offensive. And uh, hopefully you guys cut me a little bit of slack. Um, and if you have a problem with something, I'm saying rather than putting pen to paper and advancing to the, to the integrity commissioner, give me a chance first. And if I call you a snowflake or anything like that, which I won't, but then fair game, you know, you've tried. So I would appreciate that opportunity. So that's the snowflake thing. Uh, oh, so you, so you're, you're at almost eight minutes now. I know. Counsel. I'm sorry. I'm so I can't help it. All. It's me. I'm long winded. So, <laughs> but I just want to make sure you guys have context and I want Councillor Maine to know that I'm not yeah, butting my comments. I totally own them and I apologize for them and I'll, I'll either bite my tongue and not tell them what I'm thinking, or I will not use adjectives like that. So the, the bottom line is with this other thing, I really have a problem with it because just, you really need to know how this happened. We had a, a, a deputation come to us to council where the problems were identified by the Taylor Drive residents. I went to see them. I agreed wholeheartedly. I know Councillor Roshevsky did. I don't know who else did. And, uh, I agreed that, hey, you know what, there's a problem here. And we talked about it at a council meeting. And and Mr. Campbell actually came up with the, the concept that I didn't even know, wasn't even aware about, about this letter of credit, and that potentially it could be drawn upon to compel the developer to do the work. I thought, that, well, that's brilliant, all right? But nobody committed to when this was going to happen or if they were going to do it. It was just left, left open-ended. So on my Zoom meetings that I have, um, the... Uh, complainants or you know the people from Taylor popped on and they asked what's going on there was no time frames given at council I'm like yeah well that happens sometimes you know you got to like actually ask you can't assume anything with council we need to really move things along if you want to so I said well you know what I don't have a lot of power there's only three things I can do that the rest of you can't one is I can do a notice of motion and set an agenda item two if I get a seconder which we've already seen this term if you don't get one it dies if I get a seconder, I can promise you we're going to talk about this, or I'm going to bring it up and talk about the options. And the third thing I can do that no one, none of the rest of the residents can do is I can vote. So those are the three things that would happen had I brought it to council. And that's all I did, folks, is I committed to talking about this. I didn't commit to anything that I couldn't do, and I never contacted the developer, just to be clear. After I had my Zoom meeting, I guess the developer watched the YouTube video or the uh, Zoom video, called me at home on my phone, in my kitchen on a Sunday or whatever it was, some evening, my wife was there listening, where I repeatedly stated that I have no ability to compel anybody to do anything. All I'm gonna do and what I committed to the residents to do, because they're residents and that's my duty, is I'm gonna talk about this. I have the power and the authority to set agenda items, anything I wanna talk about, anything at all. And if I get a seconder, we talk about it. So. I'm effectively being convicted here for saying that I was going to set an agenda item, which I ultimately didn't do because the developer offered, say, listen, what can we do to stop this? Uh, maybe they, they thought that I had enough sway that I might actually get this thing passed and get it to a vote, right? One of the three things I'm empowered to do. So they offered to take care of the top three problems of the eight or nine that were complained about. And they said to me, and she said to me, Bill, if, if we do these three things, are you still going to bring that motion to council? And my response was, of course not. Why would I bring a motion to council to compel you to do something that you've just volunteered to do on your own? That's absurd. In my mind, it was a done deal, over with. And I recall, actually, I wrote a little speech, and I, I read it off at the next council meeting, lauding praises on them. So effectively, what I'm being told I can't do is listen to residents' tales of woe. Secondly, I can't commit to them that I'm going to bring it to council as a notice of motion, if I want to talk about it in this forum, which is my right, assuming one of you believes in it enough to let me bring it to the floor by seconding it, 
and ultimately it may or may not end up in a in a vote. But in between that, you're at staff, minutes, no, I know I'm sorry, you know what? But I'm you're oh, gonna, I'm going to get hung with the dry. I should get to say this stuff. In between that, staff get to provide their input. So had this come to council as an actual notice of motion and had one of you fine folks decided I'm going to second this and we talked about it, that would be the time for staff to say, well, as a matter of fact, this is happening or that's happening or whatever's going on or you don't know about this. And the thing could have died on the floor. So the whole process actually works, but it wasn't, it, none of that happened because I didn't bring the notice of motion to council because so the problem it, evaporated on its own. So this is where I'm... Good. You're out of Sorry. time here, Councillor. Uh, so the the, the 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 person adjudicating fact here has indicated that uh, their their view of this and stepping in where where staff should have really been. And um, so, uh, if you want to just wrap that up, then we'll move on, please. Okay. Well, I guess here's the deal. Um, I guess I don't have a defense on this one, and I'm I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I don't lie. I am not going to stop taking residents' calls and concerns. I'm not going to stop looking into them. And if I decide there's merit, if I decide there's merit to the complaint, I will advance a notice of motion. And if I find one of you kind souls decides to second it, we will have a conversation about it and maybe something will happen. And I'm not going to stop doing that because that's my job. And I'm, I'm guess I'm going to be revisited and sanctioned repeatedly because that's what I do. Now, it's, it's very important that we understand if you look further down tonight's agenda, you will find a notice of motion that I advanced on behalf of residents' concerns. I didn't talk to staff and say, hey, staff, can you guys it's, do this for me? Because we do off, that when we have the motion. Topic, it's going way off topic. So it's exactly it's, the same thing, Your Worship. No, it's it's, ex no, it's no. a motion on the floor to have Nothing. something happen that staff would do. We're talking about the report uh, you've advanced a position about how you feel about it. I think at this juncture, um, unless you've said something additional to add, I'm going to move to other councillors for their opinion on this. I get what you've made your point. It's pretty clear. You're pretty adamant about it. Uh, I think it's uh, some of your points are incorrect. I'll speak to those when it's my turn. If you don't have so. Right. Okay, fair enough. So I mean, I'm gonna. I own 100% the snowflake. I disagree with the characterization of bullying and harassing. Um, and I just don't. And I believe it's corrosive and undermining of our our collegial working relationship by advancing uh, these grievances to the integrity commissioner without speaking to me first. In fairness to John, he tried to, which ended up in the snowflake comment, but the other two never did. They just jumped in and threw this process into place. And I find that a little distressing, but I don't hold it against you guys. I'll still work with you. If you're right about something, I'll be on your side. If you're not, I'll argue against you. And that's the way thank it's going to work for the next two years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shesky wants to speak, so you can have your five minutes now. Okay, I just had a question for clarification. Uh, I, I was just wondering if the uh, contractor in question was interviewed during this process and did they feel intimidated or uh, wrongfully persuaded in any way? Ms. Potowski, can you answer that? There we are. Thank you. Yes, uh, we did investigate uh, fully on this and uh, that we made the finding that uh, we did not find there was undue influence. Thank you. Are you satisfied, Councillor? Yes. Would you like me to continue with my... If you wish. My position? Oh, sure. Why not? I'm here. Uh, thank, you. Thank, thank you for the floor. Uh, I did uh, prepare just a few lines here, but I'm going to cut it right short. And uh, for the record, I did provide this to Councillor Gordon this morning, so uh, this certainly isn't a blind side for him or uh, anything he hasn't heard uh, within the last 24 hours. So for the public record, I do not support the way Councillor Gordon engages staff uh, sometimes, the way that he speaks to his colleague and his tone in emails or on social media sometimes. I would not do some of the things that Councillor Gordon does and feels are his duty as a councillor such as going around staff to contact contractors or staff at other organizations without what I feel is going through the proper channels. And I'll speak to that after the, just a bit of history. Um, Councillor Gordon is not my counselor. I didn't have the ability to vote for Councillor Gordon, um, but the residents who did have the uh, opportunity to vote obviously felt he was the guy for the job. 
Uh, he made it no secret uh, he was running as a disruptor, as a person that was going to be teamed up against, but would ultimately get things done that he intended to do. Uh, since then, he has likely had more code of conduct violations against him than anyone here. But he has also submitted more notices of motion and brought more ideas to the council table than any, any of us as well. And in terms of integrity, doing what you say you're going to do, he has done just that. Uh, the residents are the judges of what kind of job he is doing as a counselor, in my opinion. My opinion is completely irrelevant. Um, no, I don't believe council and staff deserve the language that he has used or his tone or um, his abrasiveness sometimes. Uh, I will not defend his actions, but I can't sit up here and act like I'm someone who's qualified to question his integrity. Uh, we've spent more time at council talking about uh, each other's integrity than we have discussed Midland Bay Landing, the Lake Park, Team Midland, youth, seniors, accessibility. And uh, thank you to Councillor Prost for uh, highlighting this uh, thought so passionately. I really appreciate that. Um, these are all the things that our constituents are expecting us to move forward on in this term. Uh, we were elected to lead as an example uh, and set that for the community. I understand that. Uh, I will support, support the recommendation in support of staff as a symbolic gesture. Uh, but I do think that spending likely thousands of dollars on a 14 page report and perhaps a banner on the town page that says Councillor Gordon is a disruptor maybe one of the biggest wastes of money we've spent in my six years up here. Uh, and I mean, no disrespect whatsoever to the process or to principal's integrity. And, uh, just in terms of my comments about going around staff, uh, I was contacted by the same contractor and um, that he's being punished for and uh, did speak with them at length. Uh, I did go meet with the residents and I did follow up to the, um, to the contractors, the developers. Um, I think the difference is the way that we present ourselves and our, our, who we are as people and who we are as counselors. Uh, it's very clear that I find myself a very different person and a very different counselor than Councillor Gordon. Having said that, um, I quote Deputy Mayor Ross and saying he's a great counselor uh, in the media this week. Uh, the public obviously felt so. Um, he's very popular in social media. He's getting stuff into the public eye and uh, I have to appreciate that. Uh, I just wish that these integrity commissioner things weren't part of this whole thing. And uh, Councillor Prost, uh, your comments about loving being on council. Uh, I can certainly appreciate that this term we've spent way too much time doing this. And in the previous term was as bright and sunny as you probably picture it. So thank you for your time. I, I, I look less forward to these meetings than any other meetings, uh, even since West Crown and planning and development. So uh, I, <laughs> I uh, no disrespect, Mr. Crown, I love you and I miss you, but um, I uh, support the motion um, for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, many of the comments, of course, are, are but that, Mr. that uh, Councillor Sefti has shared, I would echo around um, the amount of time that we're spending on this. Um, one of the interesting challenges I have, uh, the, we could all, well, I could fall down that rabbit hole of a developer calling me and asking me something and me giving my opinion and having something happen. I could easily fall down that rabbit hole. So that um, it is an interesting awareness for me. Um, that doesn't mean I won't do it. I won't take calls and I, I won't listen. Um, I will be more aware of bringing things to staff and looping in staff if I haven't or it wasn't. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about this report is that it does um, acknowledge milder language, yet it still acknowledges that kind of death by a thousand cuts. It is something that we have seen in this council as an ongoing challenge to how a meeting runs. And so I don't think it can be ignored. I don't think it's an either or. I just, again, would love to see a, a better, smoother way of working with this. Um, in fact, Councillor Gordon's comments tonight, his 12 minutes made me less confident in his ability to change without a process in becoming more parliamentarian and respectful in his language, um, telling us the context may make it understandable, but it doesn't make it excusable. So that is a little concern for me. Councillor Gordon and I had a great conversation about, could you say a stronger response versus being a snowflake? And a lot of it does come down to that languaging piece. And I would love to see that language not appear in our meetings. And I, it's not something that stopped back in March. 
and I'd love to have some con it's not something I marked down though either and then call Councillor Gordon about afterwards but there are certainly some uncomfortable moments during council meetings in fact I'm a little uncomfortable and I find it inflammatory and a little um, uncomfortable for you saying we're about to hang you out to dry that is not what we're doing we are going to likely support this motion because it's right because treating each other with respect and treating staff with respect is the right thing to do and this report's recommendations are correct not because we're hanging you out to dry and so it's that kind of language those a thousand cuts that would be wonderful to see disappear from our council meetings it would make them a much, much more pleasant place to be a much more comfortable place to be and very few of us want to have a conversation that is confrontational afterwards even if you have said yes i will approach you with welcome we have seen the past and we would have some discomfort calling up and saying councillor gordon i didn't like it when you said i hung you out to dry i felt that found that insulting because you know, it, it is a confrontation. Most of us don't like that. So having a method in, in which to move forward without that language in our council meetings will help us get to the, the bigger, exciting, wonderful things, easier, faster, with more joy and momentum. So I don't think it is an either or. And I also would love to see this be an end to that. I don't, I don't know that I'm hearing that it will be this evening, and I think that a, a mechanism moving forward is good. And I, I mean, I'm looking at you in your video and it looks like you're wearing Mickey Mouse ears, which is lovely and approachable and cuddly <laughs> in your background. And so let's just keep doing that. It's actually your background behind you has little ears over your head. It, and so that adds to some fun to it. Maybe we'll get you- It's a halo. It. It's a halo. <laughs> is that what it is? I knew yeah, it had to be something. I'm feeling angelic right now. <laughs> and I appreciate, but I'm, I'm, we don't usually have banter back and forth, but I do appreciate your comments. And when I said the hanging out to dry thing, I wasn't even thinking, I mean, because I was being interrupted mid-sentence and I wanted to get my stuff across, that was just like autopilot. So I'm going to have autopilot faux pas like that because that's me and I'm sorry. Huh. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, like if we're going to be talking quick, like bang, 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 I may say something like that and I'll apologize. Now I guess it doesn't make it right, but I mean, it's me. Oh, sorry. Councillor Cunningham, so you've just given up uh, this your time to Councillor Gordon, or do you want to continue? I would just like to finish with um, being, putting it in context, making it understandable doesn't erase it. And I think that you are actually capable of, in context, in the bup, 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 still being able to be parliamentarian in your language. And I look forward to seeing that in the future. More. I mean, not saying, oh my goodness, he never is, but those slips and those gaffes that I think they can disappear. I'll try. I will. Thank you. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, Councillor Deputy Mayor Ross. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, through you, um, I take this seat very seriously. And uh, to me, it is an honor to sit here. And we set out rules that we need to follow. And to me, I want to follow them. I'm going to do everything I can to. And I did give Councilor Gordon, I reached out to him uh, about a week ago and reached out and I said, I would be try to be a better person because that's what I want to be in my life and show my kids that I will try to be a better person. And uh, I will do my best to reach out to him. Am I going to do it all the time? Probably not. I'd like to say I will, but I probably won't, but I'm going to try. And I gave him my word that I would. So, but with that said, I think it's so important that we're not looking to get a pound of flesh or uh, you know do anything to anyone. We just we set out rules together, and we're asking people to follow them. I don't understand why or if it's such a big deal. The rules were set out. We all agreed and we all voted and we said we would follow them. That's all I'm looking to to do. Follow the rules. And that to me, this office is all about uh, honor, integrity, and that's what I'm looking to follow. With, I'd also like to add, Facebook, social media gets us all in trouble. And uh, the town of Midland spends a lot of, lot of money every year 
We have a website. We have a full-time uh, person that uh, runs our communications, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And when council goes on and does other things, Zoom meeting or uh, hosts things online, it really does confuse our residents with regards to, is it councilor X, Y, or Z telling me this? And I'm seeing something else on the town website and I'm seeing something from councilor Z over here. It really, really confuses our, our residents. So I would ask, uh, not that I would ever tell anybody, please get off Facebook, but I would ask that we do be a little more cautious on what we're doing and what we're posting online. We, there's a huge opportunity if you have an idea that you want uh, to push through a survey, et cetera. I guarantee our communications officer would love uh, the opportunity for ideas and push it through our town website and force your followers to our website. It's gonna help with transparency. It's gonna help with clarity. And we really won't find ourselves in a position that a, um, a developer or any other person is hearing something from a third party. So if we could learn anything, that would be it. I, I really think it's important to keep the message as a group. We're a team. And when we have six or eight or nine different messages being relayed out there, it really does confuse our residents. So, you know, I, I'm gonna, end with all I want to do is follow the rules and if we could all keep with the same message we coming into uh, 2021 I'm willing to start fresh uh, finish off these last two years strongly and uh, make Midland the town and uh, work as hard as I can for the people of our, our, our residents and the town I love so Mr. Gordon I give you my word I will uh, Councilor Gordon I apologize I will give you my word I will uh, do my best to reach out to you uh, when I feel I'm being pronged and uh, and I hope that you would uh, accept my phone call and the conversation open-minded and uh, and um, we can hopefully move together forward together. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, next, I would ask um, Councillor Prost. You're still there. You go. Thank you. Um, I think I've kind of made my position pretty clear. I completely agree with um, everything Councillor Ocheski said, um, completely and word for word. Um, with no disrespect to our integrity commissioner, the town or any of my fellow councillors, I won't support this tonight. I don't think it should have come this far. I think we need to find a better way and I'm just gonna stand by that. We need to find a better way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor um, Downer, I'm sorry, I missed you. Yes, thank you very much, Your Worship. Can you hear me? I can, thank you. Okay, uh, for the record, I came forward on my own fruition. Nobody forced me to sign anything. Nobody reached out to me to support anything. Uh, integrity Commissioner, uh, report I support 100%. I find Councillor Gordon sometimes uh, off the wall. And uh, I think what this council needs, it needs to get together as a group and spend some time together. And uh, I really think this COVID thing has, has knocked everything out of whack, but we can't, we can't condone behavior. When you speak, you're responsible for what comes out of your mouth. Just remember that you speak for this whole council. You don't speak just for yourself. So I will support the uh, motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor McGinn, please. So thank you to everybody who spoke and um, and how well you spoke and to the degree that you decided to communicate and the depth. Um, one of the things that is immediately coming to mind is that when we're using social media, that there is a lack of, a lack of context. So quite often, so quite often things are um, interpreted based on, based on, you know, personal history. I'm not trying to diminish when a person feels that something has offended them in any manner. Uh, because that is deeply personal, but I believe that you know we need to 
to use the tools available that we have as adults and reach out and say, hey, you know what, this bothered me and explain why, and then give the opportunity to move forward in a healthy manner, which I believe is happening tonight. The conversation that is happening tonight is in a healthy manner. Um, now, it's a new era, so it, this is tough. Um, I know that from the previous council and uh, even the first, you know, this first two years of, of my term, that social media has been, has been a difficult one. It's, it's been, it's been very tough. There have been times where I myself to, to, you know, to, to expand upon it and personalize have had to look and say, whoa, you can't say that on my wall and you can't speak that way. And if it carries further, you know, this whole idea of not being able to, to honestly and openly and as a raw and honest human, which is the way we all ran, communicate because it could potentially be used against us is terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, and it's not something that existed, you know, 10, 10 years ago, it really didn't. So we're all trying to navigate that. Um, I was writing notes. Um, so I'm gonna try and elevate the positive here. Um, so I have also been subject to um, Integrity Commissioner's report and I know that I plead. I plead for forgiveness. I plead for an opportunity. I, I plead for understanding. Um, so I'm hearing that. I am hearing, I'm hearing the ownership. I understand that we are all different. And I understand that for lack of a better term, Councillor Gordon, he's, he's a tough, rough guy. That's, he ran as himself and said he was going to get things done. And I ran against him. And he's sitting right there off to my right on my screen with me. So the way he ran, he's been quite true to that. He's been quite sincere to who he is. And I cannot fault him for that. I have to respect that. And I have to respect the differences of all of us who are sitting here. And I have to elevate it and I have to support it. I cannot attempt to ask and support asking Councillor Gordon to behave differently than me or any of you. That's not right. We have a diversity, in my opinion, that is not right. We have a diversity on this council for a reason, because 17,500 people are not all the same and we were all elected to be here. Uh, so I, I also want to thank, thank Councillor Gordon for your rank and you were honest. And so you went longer than 10 minutes. We have all come to realize that that is you. So you're still being sincere. I'm not going to ask you to. No, no. <laughs> I'm not going to ask. Sometimes I may become a random. But that's you. That is you and you are being sincere. And right now, this is a stressful situation. There's only a few of us here who have been in that position. You did your best. Um, so you're emotional. And you referenced the timeline and the timeline makes sense to me. One minute, Council. One minute, okay. So I understand um, the timeline. You, you explained when this happened and we can actually see it in the report. The dates are there. To bring that up is a tough one. So I'm going to empathize with you and understand that at, that, at, at the time that your emotions were elevated, uh, you had said back then your emotions were elevated, you navigated through it. Um, personally, I have, I have seen a change in some of the language and the attempts that you're using. And I'm, you know, I, I'm gonna uplift that and I'm gonna support that. Um, so I will not, be supporting a, another, I'm not supporting this. We have got to find a better way. We are capable of finding a better way. There are nine of us. There are nine different personalities. We can do better. 
This is a waste of taxpayers' dollars. And this is not us working together. This is not forming a unity. What we are doing is reprimanding each other and we are causing each other harm. Thank you. We don't need to be doing that to each other anymore. Thank you. Councillor Main. Um, yeah, we have a lengthy agenda and I've got a chance to ask the question, so I'll be very brief here. Um, well, I guess it comes down to additional context is, you know, we've gone through code of conduct training. That was one of the first things we did. We had one code of conduct before us and now we have another and we're trying to learn from it. And I guess people are saying, why didn't we go the informal complaint route? And I would reply, I certainly have. Last year, when the code of conduct issue had raised the issue with Councillor Gordon saying, oh, you know, I see a social media piece. It's, you know, maybe a little bit questionable. And the response is, okay, I've changed a little bit as opposed to change, deleting the whole thing. And so there, this isn't just, let me be perfectly clear. This is not about the snowflake comment, right? This isn't snowflake man can't take the heat and he's called the integrity commissioner months later. This was because we saw a series of kind of questionable conduct, emails to staff, social media posts. And so we put it forward be saying, this is a learning opportunity that we need to adhere to the code of conduct. And so, you know, back and forth of the pandemic with the snowflake comment, again, you know, everyone was super worried, you know, we wanted to meet virtually, but the point certainly that I was making is instead of emailing all of council, which we know we're not supposed to do from the ombudsman, was point it to the mayor or the CAO and say, we need to change the procedural bylaw so that we can allow telecommunications. It turned out that you needed, the province had to amend the municipal act. And really that's the whole point is to funnel all of our questions and thoughts and work collaboratively with staff. And again, if we don't like the answer we get from staff, we have the formal opportunity to change policy with notice of motion or master planning or whatever. So I just also wanted to make a quick note that I know people are saying this is a divided council, you know, there's a lot of disrespect voting around. It's, I know it's not fun when people vote against your motion. I get it, man, join the club. I mean, that's why I felt all first term, right? But we, we agree on more issues than we disagree. And we can't let personal differences, policy differences become personal differences. And really that's just the thing going forward. Thank you much, Councillor Gordon. I was not accepting your apology. All we are looking for is changed behavior. Oh, Rosie, you want to say hi to everyone in the town? Oh, hey, sweetheart. Uh, um, and so this is a great time for you to come in and interrupt. Uh, I just want to say, I really hope going forward that we don't have to keep having the integrity back. And I do, I will certainly take the suggestion of following up with an informal complaint as opposed to form a complaint but the problem was this was kind of a series of issues that we kind of wanted to have addressed. So it's hard to go each and every single one because they're not code of conduct issues, when you, but when you add them all up, it kind of adds to, as we said, a kind of a pattern of lack of decorum. So with that, moving forward, we're gonna you know, agree to disagree. We're gonna keep it clean, keep, uh, you know, as they say in boxing, you know, keep it above the waist, you know, as they say in MMA, no eye gouges, fish hooks. We're gonna to try to keep a clean fight, keep it uh, fair and try to keep the disdain uh, or personal different differences away from the public uh, conversation. So thank you uh, for this opportunity and I can't want to do anything else but to move on. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, start the timer here. So for me, I've heard the question, why a code of conduct? Well, it's legislated. You need a code of conduct uh, by law. But more than that, it's about setting a bar for behaviors that you're going to be measured against. You're going to measure yourself against it. And other people are going to measure you against it. And at some point in time, you may have the integrity commissioner measure you against it. And we have an integrity commissioner because we want an independent third party to assess our behaviors relative to that standard. These are the rules that uh, Deputy Mayor Ross spoke about. They're fairly broad and they really succinctly are. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So um, it, it, it is unfortunate that this council started with an adversarial as opposed to collegial component to it, which was litigation, 
Uh, and uh, as a consequence of that, it set the tone for some conversation going back before uh, this council, in fact. So it's unfortunate that happened, but we are held to that uh, standard. Uh, it has intruded on this council, but to Councillor Main's point, and uh, I respectfully disagree with Councillor Oshevsky, this council's got a lot done. Uh, this this uh, staff has got a lot done with respect to uh, within the COVID environment. We're going to go into code, it looks like we're going to go code red next week. So be prepared for that. And I would say that to the broader public. But despite all of the, the setbacks, we have a new main street, we have a homelessness committee, we're working on housing, and it just goes on and on and on. To have to deal with this sort of thing, I agree, is, a, is just a colossal waste of energy. I've heard everybody say here this evening that this is a learning opportunity. So, okay, learn. Uh, if we do need to get together, uh, I mean, the code of conduct is pretty clear. And do unto others as have you would have them do unto you. It's pretty clear. Um, this is supposed to be a collegial environment where we debate facts, look at reports, express opinions on those reports, vote. And if you happen to be on the winning side of the vote, you, you can walk away feel, feeling pretty good about it. And if you're not, well, then you can walk away feeling pretty good that you expressed your opinion. It was considered by your peers and we've moved a different direction. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to come back up later if, uh, if there's reason to do so. But we're a team. We need to treat each other as a team going to a particular goal. I think that I know Councillor Gordon knows that. Uh, otherwise, he would be in constant world of hurt in this uh, world of employment. So clearly, uh, he, he understands that. I, I think that the, um, the language and behaviors and so on were cumulative, and people are, to Councillor Cunningham's point, loath to get involved in confrontation. Um, I spoke recently to Councillor Gordon and said, why don't we do a restart here? Why don't we just agree that the past is the past and move forward? I think we agreed on that. Um, and uh, I think that it's, uh, there's, you'll see it later on this evening, some opportunity to in fact do that. Um, as far as Councillor Gordon's uh, dealing with the contractor, A, it's an identifiable individual. B, the use of a line of credit is a last resort, absolutely a last resort. Staff are dealing with this individual. The fact that the residents may not like the pace at which staff are dealing with it or which the, the planning environment or the legal environment allows you to deal with it, I'm sorry for that. But staff are dealing with it. There's lots of opportunity from my perspective to listen to somebody's complaint, direct them to the individual staff member to, or, uh, or, uh, to, to deal with the issue or help them through to the staff member and attend. But in no way am I going to presume to know, be the subject matter expert on all these things. We retain people for that. And so I think to your point, Councillor Gordon, by all means, please bring these things forward. Try to direct it through staff and get to a re re result because I know there was stuff going on in the background on that account that are put in jeopardy because of your actions um, or potentially have are. And it makes it very awkward. So, uh, in summary, I would just like to say that I am going to support the recommendation because I think it's appropriate. Um, I do love the tone that's coming out here about let's learn from this. So, please, let's do. And um, I would just say that uh, the summation by Ms. Potowski about the golden rule was really, says, it, says it all. You'll find that golden rule in about 21 different religions. It has a lot of weight and gravitas to it. It really is a good guiding light and I would recommend it to all of you. I certainly try to do that in my, in my view. So I've used up my time, I'll stop there. Um, and with that, what I'll do now is to read the motion and then call the question. So it's moved by Councillor Downer and seconded by Councillor Main, that further to the recommendation report of the Integrity Commissioner respecting complaints against Councillor Gordon dated December 2nd, 2020, and having been found to have breached the code of conduct for the town of Midland, that Councillor Gordon be and is hereby formally reprimanded that this report and that this report be posted on the town of Midland website for public access. So I'm going to call a question on that. Uh, 
All those in favor? Sorry, Your Worship, just letting you know I'm 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 tapping out of this one. I didn't turn my camera off or anything, but I'm clearly have a conflict in the, of interest in that. So thank you. So uh, it's uh, that carry one, two, three, four, five, six. That carries. So uh, now with that, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Potovsky for her um, attention to the matter, to the, the, the detail in, in the investigation, to the wisdom around, um, around, around the golden rule. And I, I wish I could remember the other thing you said was to wrap it up so nicely. Uh, I think I wrote it down here somewhere. And I'd like to stay, in, stay in your own lane. Stay in your own lane. There we are. Thank you. And particularly stay in your own lane. Yeah. Um, with that, also, I'd like to wish uh, you a Merry Christmas and all the best in the new year. To stay healthy. Uh, happy Hanukkah to, I think, Mr. Abrams, if I'm not mistaken. And um, again, thank you very much. Hopefully, we'll see you in a more uh, collegial environment for an educational piece. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Thank you all of Council and all the best of the season for you as well. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, I have a request here for a bio break. Um, not to be mean. Yes, we'll have a five minute recess. Uh, we'll be back here at uh, nine o'clock. And we'll get going here. For, uh... Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, next on the item, we have the pulled items. We first up, we have the report. Um, sorry, Waterworks Master Report. Sorry, Master Plan, dated December 9, thousand twenty. We received. So uh, it's the staff report CSR two thousand twenty forty four. Waterworks Master Plan, dated December 9, two thousand twenty. Two thousand and twenty. Sorry, be received and that council adopt. Draft water servicing master plan dated October 2020 and direct staff to issue the notice of compliance as per the municipal class environmental assessment process and two, that council include the approved capital budget for the study to 148,600 as outlined in this report. Any questions or comments with regards to this? So sorry, I need to put on the record that this is moved by Councilor McGinn and second by Councilor Downer. Any questions or comments with regards to this report? Councilor Main? Oh, this would have been uh, a fantastic thing to do one of those virtual walkthroughs like we did the wastewater thing, but I know that they've done a great job on public information. It was just great reading over it. Um, I guess I had one very specific question. Um, great layout about what the recommendations are about how to boost the zones. It's kind of fun to see the town chunked up into different zones. It was on the Sundowner Well. Um, and that's obviously in a very long term about bringing Sundowner Well on to meet future capacity needs. Uh, obviously there's a concern when we drilled Sundowner Well of the presence of TCE or trichloroethylene. And it basically talks about in 15 years, you're going to want to fire it up, run it for 72 hours, do some TC testing, and you know add it to your system. The question is, should we be, if we want to get it up and running as a future well, should we be doing any testing uh, in the meantime? Because uh, TC is a, it, it basically sits on groundwater, and the plume can stay where it is, or sometimes can move elsewhere or dissipate. Um, it's just a question about testing uh, if we want to get Sundowner Well up and running. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Campbell, if you care to comment, and uh, Mayor Strathern, your mic is on. Uh, through you, uh, Deputy Ross. Uh, yes, we need to do tests on that well, and we've started the process with the consultants. We have to do a 72-hour pump test, and we can't do it. Uh, we're waiting until the county finishes the, the work that we're on, uh, on Bomb Beach Road. We're gonna be uh, redoing the servicing out there, uh, we'll be filling that ditch with a significant amount of water during the, the pump test. And the county has said, let's just wait till we're done the Bomb Beach work, which will be uh, next year. So we'll be doing that pump test in 2022 uh, to answer your question. And uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, we do have the consultant uh, uh, available tonight to answer questions and they did prepare a, a, a presentation. If it is late in the day, if, if uh, no. Council oh. wishes to hear the presentation, we can 
we'll gladly do that. Wonderful. And I'm hearing, uh, Madam Clerk, that uh, we may not be on camera with regards to uh, for the public. So I received a text, but uh, I would love to hear the presentation. Uh, if we could keep it to five minutes and we'll ask some questions, that would be fantastic. Is, would that be comparable, uh, Mr. Campbell? Uh, the presentation had a pre-recorded audio to it, so we wouldn't be Perfect. able to cut it short, but... No, no. Uh, it's fine. Let's do it. Okay, it's only meeting this month, so uh, we'll stay late. I love it. Let's go. Uh, uh, Deputy Clerk, if you can queue up the presentation. Sherry, we're not hearing the audio. Is this meeting going up on YouTube so people can watch this later or do they have to catch it on Rogers? It'll be up on YouTube as well. We can we can make sure that it is. Fantastic. Thank you. No pressure, Sherry. I apologize. I'm here with Zach, and he's just helping me with the volume. One second. I'm, I'm still hearing uh, reports that it's, the camera is still not on for the public on Rogers. I'm not sure if Rogers has left the building or... They have been experiencing some technical difficulty all evening, and I know that they are working on it. Okay. So uh, any public uh, watching tonight, we apologize. Rogers is uh, experiencing some uh, difficulties, and uh, they're working on it. We hope to have it back online. We are recording this meeting, and it will be uh, up on YouTube uh, for um, your, your viewing pleasure. But hopefully Rogers will be back up and running very soon. We apologize. We still can't hear anything if there's supposed to be audio. Um, Mr. Andy Campbell, is there supposed to be audio right now? Um, yes, yes, there is. If we're unable to get it working, uh, we can just post it on online afterwards instead of delaying the meeting any further. And we'll take questions from sure. council and our consultants are available uh, is there some keynotes that, the, uh, Mr. Campbell, is there some keynotes that the consultant would like to share with us before we uh, uh, start?
start asking the questions. I, it's unfortunate that the presentation not working and we definitely will view it at a later time, but if you want to take a few minutes to uh, give us some the Coles notes. Excuse me for interrupting, but there was a note here from uh, somebody that was watching that suggested that uh, when you share the screen for the presentation, please option to share the PC audio with the share screen. Does that okay. make any difference? I think that's, uh, uh, Samian, are you, I think that's uh, what you mentioned earlier as well, right? Uh, okay. I know there's an option. I'm a senior environmental planner with ACOM. Oh, there you go. And I'm here tonight with my colleague, Samian Chaimian, who is a, an engineer with ACOM. And tonight we've prepared a brief presentation for you to summarize the water servicing master plan update completed for the municipality. So I will deal with the first couple of slides uh, and address the municipal class EA process and talk a little bit about the consultation completed. And then I'll turn it over to Semyon who will get into the more technical aspects related to the project. He will touch on anticipated growth, key deficiencies, the recommended strategy, as well as cost estimates and timing. So the Town of Midland retained ACOM to complete an update to the existing water servicing master plan to reflect growth in the community, plan development and operational changes. This update will provide a comprehensive water servicing infrastructure plan for the community for the next 20 years and will also support the town's official plan review and development charges study. So the project study area as illustrated in the figure on this slide indicates uh, or sorry, includes the limits of the town of Midland as well as several key stakeholders located within their neighboring Tay Township that are currently serviced by the town of Midland. So this includes St. Marie Among the Hurons, Martyr Shrine and the Weimarsh Wildlife Centre. This undertaking was completed in accordance with master plan approach number two of the Municipal Class EA with the intent of completing phases one and two of the Municipal Class EA process thereby fulfilling the requirements for the Schedule A, A prime, and Select B projects identified within the document. So you can see on the figure here that uh, phase one involves identification of the problem or opportunity. And during phase two, we look at alternative solutions to address that, those problems. So as part of that process, we do an inventory of the natural, cultural, and socioeconomic environment. And we use that information to identify areas of environmental sensitivity or constraint. And that is in turn used to evaluate the alternatives under consideration uh, to determine their potential for impact. And as part of this process, we, we solicit input from the public agencies and stakeholders and, and uh, obtain their comments. And all of that information is used to evaluate the alternatives and in selecting a, a, the preferred solutions or preferred strategy for moving forward. So as part of this process, consultation was completed with the public, relevant agencies, key stakeholders and Indigenous communities and included two public information centers and issue of three formal notices. So PIC1 was made available as an online presentation in February 2019 and PIC2 was a more formal event hosted by the municipality in May 2019. We did do a follow-up with Indigenous communities uh, by email and telephone in December 2019, early January 2020. And uh, the final notice to be issued will be the notice of completion following endorsement of this master plan by uh, Municipal Council. So in the blue box on the right, you can see some of the key concerns and comments that we received throughout this process. Uh, some property owners questioned how and when their land holdings would be serviced. Others uh, were curious about the implementation schedule for the recommended projects. There was support for connecting the Midland and Penetang Machine municipal water systems. Uh, the fire department commented that they would like to see fire hydrants uh, with fire flows available everywhere in the town. Uh, for Indigenous communities, the key interests related to any archaeological studies completed as part of the master plan, as well as the potential to impact Georgian Bay water quality and fish habitat. 
So that sums it up for the Class EA process and consultation. I'm going to turn it over to Sami and Chaman. Thank you, Andrea. So as with many, many Waterworks master plan updates, it is important to review the anticipated population growth projections because population growth correlates with increase in water demand and municipal servicing needs. The town of Midland is identified as a primary ur urban settlement area in the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe and is therefore anticipated to continue growth and development in the community. The existing population of Midland is approximately 17,000 people. The province of Ontario, through the growth uh, plan for the Greater Golden, Sh Golden Horseshoe, has allocated the population uh, for the town of Midland of 22,500. And with about 1,800 new jobs by the year 2031. So the table presented on this slide shows the population and employment forecasts for the town of Midland from 2006 to 2041. And I wanted to note that 2036 and 2041 forecasts are estimates only and have not been allocated by the County of Simcoe. So given the growth anticipated for the municipality, it is important that the municipal servicing infrastructure can sufficiently accommodate the demand required. In order to identify key deficiencies, this master plan update involved a review of existing municipal wells, pumping capacity, elevated tank and stent pipe storage capacity, uh, including backup pumping capacity and pipe capacity for the entire water distribution network. We used the town's residential and employment forecasts, uh, which were indicated in the previous slide, and any known or expected approved subdivision developments. And these were integrated into the assessment of the existing system to confirm future water demands. The analysis of storage, pump capacity, and well production capacity concluded the following. Pump station capacity. We identified that the Lescott and Sunny side or also known as the Everton pressure zones, lack sufficient pumping capacity to meet future fire flow needs. The storage evaluation concluded that the east pressure zone does not have sufficient water storage by year 2026. For well supply capacity, the evaluation identified that there is insufficient well supply capacity by 2041. In terms of pressure, system pressure, Low pressure in area of south of Little Lake on Highway 12 between King Street and County Road 93 has been identified as a deficiency and also redundancy. So there's need for redundancy of supply to the sunny side zone, which is to the north of uh, the town of Midland. In addition to the key deficiencies, a number of existing inch issues were identified as part of this master plan process. Uh, a couple of examples of uh, these issues are aging infrastructure. The Dominion standpipe, for example, is uh, more than 100 years old and requires some attention in terms of maybe rehabilitation. There's a maintenance cost and operational concerns related to Montreal tank that requires pumping uh, in order to supply the west pressure zone. There are also well uh, physical integrity um, issues uh, for a number of wells, well of 12 and uh, 15 in the system that require attention. And well 1A is currently not in use. This information was presented as part of the PIC, PIC 1 package and was solicited to, for public um, any questions or concerns, uh, as well as the town. In order to address key deficiencies and mitigate some of the uh, issues identified previously, uh, a recommended strategy was developed. The recommended strategy takes a phased approach where it looks at short-term, mid-term, and long-term projects uh, to 
uh, mitigate the issues that were identified. In the short term, which is one to five years, it is recommended to upgrade the Everton booster pump station and Hanley booster pump, sta pump stations in order to address the um, fire flow deficiency in these pressure zones. It is also recommended to abandon wells 12 and 1A due to their physical integrity. And it is also recommended to extend the life of Dominion and Montreal standpipes by five to 10 years until a more permanent solution to a storage uh, deficiency can be identified. We also uh, rec recommend uh, twinning of the Harborview Drive water main uh, to address some of the uh, redundancy concerns along, uh, along this road and in the sunny side pressure zone. In the midterm, um, five to 10 years, we identified that the new storage is required in the east pressure zone. Uh, and once the new storage uh, tank is complete, then the Dominion and Montreal standpipes can be decommissioned. To address the low pressure in the Highway 12 and King Street areas, um, it is recommended that a new pressure zone is uh, commissioned, which would require a booster pump station. In the long term, uh, to address the supply, uh, in, in, inefficient, insufficient supply, um, it is recommended that the Sundowner well um, is commissioned, although it is subject to a 72-hour pump test to confirm that the TC levels and the treatment requirements feasibility um, are within the provincial water quality objectives uh, for human consumption. To address some of the future uh, developments along Bomb Beach, uh, it is anticipated that a booster pump station would be required. And uh, to provide some um, redundancy for the supply of to the south uh, pressure zone, a new trunk water main um, is envisioned along Highway 93 uh, from the area of Palm Beach Road to Highway 12. Cost estimates and timing were also provided for each project. The timing is consistent with the phasing for, uh, for the recommended projects. The cost estimates are at the conceptual level and are based on the existing projects that we have in the area. Each project was also evaluated whether it benefits primarily the existing customers or if it's triggered by growth and benefits only the new customers. The details of the cost estimates and timing and the split between growth and non-growth is detailed in the master plan and we'd be happy to discuss those details with you. This is the, this is the last slide in our presentation and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to present this information to you and we'll be happy to answer any of the questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, any questions or comments from Council? Councilor Main? Uh, thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, I was I was uh, confused that in 15, 20 years we would do trichloroethylene testing and not in the next couple of years. Um, that was a great uh, report, great overview. Um, uh, one question that comes up when we're talking about uh, wastewater, and we'll ask again here, is how do you service the areas of the town that are non-growth areas, but are partially serviced? Um, so Sun Sunnyside has water, Midland Point has a little bit of water. Uh, there are some other areas in town that we don't uh, haven't been able to get to the full extent. Um, it's not really addressed in this. I guess the pipes are just too high, uh, or is it too expensive to to go out to, for a limited amount of customers? I guess, is that the justification on being able to not run pipes everywhere for just limited customers? Mr. Campbell? <clears throat> uh, yes, you know, the, the study didn't look at, uh, you know, the 
out up to middle and the end of Middle Point Road. You know, some of those areas are just as enough homes to support it. Uh, you know, it isn't a, the amount of water that would, would be needed. And that was more the um, intent of this study was to look at our, our water demands. So, you know, if those homes uh, in the remote areas of town, if, if those residents want to be serviced, I don't think it will impact on the uh, quantity of water that we need, but it is a, a very large expense for a small number of customers. And, you know, council at a later date uh, could either wish to look at local improvement for, for those uh, expenditures or to uh, build it into our capital budget. But you'll see this uh, uh, master plan today shows $38 million worth of uh, upgrades and repairs and new infrastructure that, that are needed and 38 million for our ratepayers over the next 20 years is a significant amount of money already without considering some of these uh, other remote parts of town. Um, you got a follow up, Councilor Main? Yes, I did. One thing I really liked was hearing your voices, but seeing you guys without speaking, it was like you guys, like we could hear what you were thinking or something. Um, I, I, again, the in debt, the indigenous duty to consult stuff is fantastic. And we've really worked really hard to develop that protocol with our indigenous uh, partners. So that was great. I guess the question is on the water budget stuff. Um, and I know the options are always, you know, add more uh, wells, uh, groundwater, or even a surface water. What does conservation play into it? Um, I know I was talking to uh, Mr. Elliott, he said some municipalities have gone so far with the conservation that they don't have enough water to get their system flowing. So where is the balance and, and what's the kind of what's the balance that you should strike on conservation um, for achieving goals of water budget for uh, growth? Ms. Potter or who, who would like to answer? Uh, I'll let it. Uh... Ms. Potter, make a comment, and then I can add at the end. Wonderful. Actually, I, uh, Samian, do you have that? Are you able to answer that? Uh, yes. Uh, I think to to make it uh, a short comment, uh, it, it is part. Water conservation is part of the uh, part of this process, part of the master planning process, and we certainly look at that. Uh, one note that I will make is that it's it's uh, it's hard to predict what kind of water consumption, uh, what's the impact on water consumption, any of the conservation measures would be in the future, and the um, so. But it is part of the uh, part of the master plan process, uh, and certainly it has been taken into consideration in this master plan. Oh well, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. You had something to add? And yeah. I have one of the ways we look at it is is just that we, if you look at the uh, per capita demand that was used 20 years for a person or a household was quite large. So when you look in this report, we have used uh, uh, a per capita demand that is less recognizing conservation. And just overall, one of the challenges with conservation is we have to raise rates to make up for the loss of revenue. <laughs> Lost water, and we are seeing today. Uh, you know, our residents are using less water. Uh, we have seen a bit of an uptick because people are home during the COVID crisis. Uh, but uh, you know, in general, people are conserving water in Mid in Midland. Well, that's fantastic news, Councillor Cunningham. Thank you. I was just wondering. Is it a great plan, and it's amazing how that you can think this long term. Uh, it's great to see these long-term plans come into play so that we can envision, even if we are envisioning $38 million and more. My question is about whether this anticipates the growth from the secondary plan going on that is heading north of, um, on Highway 93, north of Young, up toward Golf Link Road, whether that's part of this or that's just another 10 million. <laughs> Mr. Campbell or? Uh, uh, that has been contemplated as part of the demand analysis. Mayor Strathern, your worship. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, you mentioned uh, growth, non-growth. The uh, calculation uh, where we're talking about growth would be in addition to the uh, development charges bylaw, I take it. And are, is that already rolled into this iteration of development charges or are we waiting five years for that? Mr. Campbell? 
uh, the bylaw uh, background study or background study from last year contemplated uh, the projects that uh, we knew at the draft stage of the report. So uh, any future uh, DC background studies will have to include the balance of these projects uh, because that it equates to just a uh, $26 million through development charges is what we'd be trying to raise if council approves the uh, future uh, DC background studies and bylaw. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Your follow, follow your worship. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Gordon? Where are we at with uh, our missing 15% of our water? or if that was the right calculation. I can't remember the percentage. It was some number like that where we can't account for where our municipal water's going. Mr. Campbell? Yeah, that's uh, when we look at what our, our production is versus what is our, our billable water. And that is due to either uh, meters that are reading incorrectly or the pipes are leaking before it gets the meter. Uh, water meters last about 25 years uh, years and they start to misread and that's why when you, you see the capital budget coming forward we're going to be introducing a program to uh, replace all of the old water meters in town uh, so that we uh, start to bill for actual use and then you know we, we are unaware of uh, leaky water mains at, at, at this point uh, we have more issues on the on the wastewater side where the water is coming or excess water is coming from but it's you know, right now it's when we look at what our water loss might be from the meters, that's going to be the, the next uh, big project and investment for the, for the town to try and quantify that lost water. Follow up, Councilor Gordon? Nope, that was good. I just was wondering where the water was. Thank you very much, Councilor Main. I hope if we decommission the uh, Dominion standpipe that we keep it there just as a beautiful icon that's been standing for whatever, 120 years, it's amazing. Um, I, I so, grew up across the street from that. <laughs> it's incredible when, they, when people are talking about how old it is. It's like, that thing doesn't serve uh, owe us anything anymore. Um, I guess the question is on, uh, on storage. You're talking about basically decommissioning the Montreal and the Dominion and looking at maybe storage in the Eastern zone. Um, so is that, would that be occurring at, uh, I, I can't recall the, the elevated water tower? Do we have existing municipal lands that would be able to use for uh, these purposes? Or is that then gonna be part of the next environmental assessment to find a home for the potential of a uh, storage or elevated tank for the East uh, Booster Zone? Mr. Campbell? Uh, right now, the, the, the uh, proposal will be up on Highway 12, uh, likely at the MPUC lands in that, that area. So we do own some land in that area. Uh, so that's what we we are contemplating through this master plan, but in conjunction with that, that's that secondary booster station that's required, and there will be uh, some pressure demands from the Hanson development to get some of that infrastructure built sooner potentially than what we've contemplated through this. But again, that just gets down to financing to build a new water tower and pumping station. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? The, uh, I have one quick question. The $148,600, is that uh, on top of what the study is going to cost? Or is this a 2021 pre-budget approval? Uh, I'm just looking it up. It's it's a, uh, I want to say $13,000 increase from the original proposal two years ago. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Any other questions, comments? All right, we have a motion on the floor. Any, all those in favor? That's so carried. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for coming this evening, our honored guests. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And have a very Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, next up we have a uh, move by Councillor Main, second by Councillor Post that report CSR 2020-45 proposed temporary road closure, Midland Point Road dated December 9th, 2020 be received and one that council support staff recommendation to include the full closure of Midland Point Road as an option 
optional construction method in the construction tender. Any questions or comments or uh, do we still have uh, Mr. Campbell on the line? Mr. Campbell, do you care to add anything before we go turn over to questions? Uh, yes, as the, the, all of you are aware, if you drive that road, it's in poor condition. The asphalt's failing and it's not just the asphalt, it's the, the road bed under it. So we knew we need to fix that. And the repair of that road was scheduled for uh, this year. But as we started to do the investigation, there's a, a large culvert under that road that uh, was in worse condition than expected. And if we're going to be uh, doing major works on the road, it's uh, the time to fix that culvert as, as we do that. Uh, this will give rise, as noted in the report, to a substantial increase in the budget that will be needed to repair this road. It is a narrow platform of road. Uh, so if we have to work on that culvert, we can do half at a time and leave one lane of traffic open, or we could close the entire road, but that causes a, a, a very long and large detour for just about everyone who lives in that, that end of town. So really what the, the intent of this uh, uh, report is, is would council support a full road closure? And if so, we would put it into the tender and get a price because we believe that a full road closure would reduce the cost of the project by $200,000. We won't know till we get a tender. But on the other hand, you've read in the report that emergency services uh, would prefer the road not to be closed uh, because of the time it takes. Uh, and again, if, if, if we don't even want to consider a, a road closure, well, that simplifies our, our tender process, but it also makes it a little more difficult and we have to work with the neighbors because we'll have to have more disruption potentially as we put temporary access of, uh, around, you know, building half a culvert at a time. So, we have had a lot of uh, comments from the public. We started uh, talking with the neighbors a year ago on, on this project. With COVID, we haven't had any face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, the emails uh, through this week, uh, they, they're concerned about either, in some cases, uh, the, their property being impacted or to the road closure. So uh, we do have time uh, prior to awarding this contract to have more uh, consultation with the public if, if that's council's wish and also if we are consulting on both a road closure and a non-road closure we can bring back the results of the consultation and the results of the tender so we will know a cost uh, to council to make a decision uh, early in the or late in the winter and that we could get into construction this summer the project at a road closure will likely be uh, between five and eight weeks of, of time. It's because of the, the, the type of work. So it is a significant project for the town. So uh, at this point, all we're looking for is if uh, you, you don't, if you want to tell staff, don't even consider road closure because of comments uh, from emergency services, that just simplifies our work. But I can say it will increase the cost of the project. Oh, uh Mr. Campbell, uh, um, and I'll turn it over. I just had one quick question. Is there opportunity to turn it, to add into the tender uh, 24 hours a day construction? If we were to choose to close that road, but we did it 24 hours instead of a uh, one day, one shift, we're working 24 hours. You're saying eight weeks, we cut it down to two weeks or three weeks. Is that an option that's even available? Or uh, I'm just curious, um, I'm sort of leaning towards not shutting it down, but uh, I thought I'd ask that question. And then I'll turn it over to council. It's it's always an option, and uh, it's just more disruption for the, the the neighbors. And you know, the through discussion with them and their input to you, I'm sure we would find whether that would be a, an acceptable option or or not. But from a contractual and tendering point point of view, if if uh, the the neighbors uh, you know would support. Uh, uh, a lot of disruption but you know that's a lot of noise overnight so and the homes are right there so it would be a significant uh, impact on on the neighbors and just for clarification you will be when we approve this the tender will include the road being closed for full and also the opportunity of what it would cost to have it not closed is that correct 
yes, we would tender both so we would cool. know if there is a significant price difference okay. and uh, we'd bring that uh, result back to council. Well, I, I think it's worthwhile to hear both ends and uh, we'll make that decision. I saw Councillor Cunningham had their, her, her hand up. I presume I was going to go to you first anyway, Ward 3, Councillor uh, Cunningham, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I did not pull this because I want to oppose getting the bid for both. What I really wanted to do was give an opportunity to acknowledge that there's an, a desire for some public engagement, some public input. And I know we've had a lot of email communication from people along that stretch, but a lot of people have not had access to that. And I think that they deserve to know what has been transpiring. And I really want to thank Mr. Campbell and um, Mr. Kenny for their prompt and thorough and detailed and courteous responses to all the emails that have been coming in. We've had some phone calls coming in as well. And this uh, offer from Mr. Campbell has put something up on Engaging Midland. Let's get that feedback. Making a decision today does not mean one thing or the other. It just means that we have that flexibility of the quote. And I, I think that's valuable to know the costs monetarily as well as to turtles and to fire safety and, and the whole gamut. So that decision today to get the, the two sides of the quote is not going to um, be a decision on what we're going to do. And I think it was very important to not leave this on the consent agenda, but also not delay our deputants just in case this turned into a longer conversation with our unpredictability of our Zoom meetings to make sure that we have a chance to talk about this a little bit. So. The, there have been concerns about the added traffic of the detour, the added construction that kind of Tanguishin has coming on and Fuller, some concerns about certainly fire safety, police safety, if the vehicles have to detour around, concerns about um, the crumbling from the creek that exists in there. And so there's a lot of need for some communication both ways to say, what are we doing to look at the situation? And I just wanted this opportunity to assure that yes, we will be able to hear that public feedback. There is a place on Engaging Midland, as soon as this project is put up that you can register and sign up for notifications anytime something is added or changed, as well as to put your own comments and input. I also wanted to mention to some of our viewers who are not on email, they're not on Facebook, they write letters, and that is wonderful, that you can write a letter, address it to mayor and council, and we will all receive that. That will also be included as your input so that we can consider your concerns. I, I know there is a lot of history to that stretch of road and that creek that runs through there. I had a wonderful opportunity to talk to Mrs. Kirkup about the things that she did back in the 70s with Tay Township to shore up some of the crumbling under there and their desire to share some of that history about there's a big tree there that they feel is kind of holding everything together and goodness knows it might actually be and I think Councillor Main would probably assume yes it, it, that tree is critical. <laughs> so just being able to take the time and to know that we do have the time to consider the history, the situation, and to communicate the solution. Because just reading one line, a page two, line L does say that we will restore um, the road and the um, shoulders and, and the structure to previous levels or better is a very short piece to answer an awful lot of questions. So it felt very important to pull this piece and just give it some time and let people know that we are listening. And if you have not been privy to the flurry of emails, I assure you it has been great to see and that information will be made available on the Engaging Midland project. So if you aren't privy to those emails, you'll still be able to see what um, content and thoughts are being shared when that's put up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Chesky? Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I just like to echo a, a lot of what Councillor Cunningham is saying. Uh, thank you very much to Mr. Campbell for being so uh, forthcoming with information and uh, responsive. And uh, thank you to Councillor Cunningham for being a great Ward 3 Councillor, which is my favorite one uh, I have. So uh, I, I, I think it's uh, great that, you know, this has created so much conversation and we've got so much time to react to it. So uh, I think the biggest 
concern I'm hearing consistently is the emergency services. Um, people at the end of Lakewood Drive are already a 13 minute drive or so to the fire department at speed limit. So uh, increasing that does raise some concerns, but uh, I'm glad we're having the conversation. I'm looking forward to hearing what comes from the public and uh, thank you very much to everybody involved. Councilor Main, and then I'll go to Mayor Strathern. Yeah, if only we had uh, fire hydrants out in the, I'm just kidding. Uh, we were just talking about that. Um, actually, the only concern or the only comment that I was going to make is some people are making uh, interesting points about if we do go the route of the detour to try to mitigate the impact of all the cars driving down Cape Point Road or Curry, whatever. So I just thought that that was a, a nice suggestion from the residents. And I know the detours are not fun. So we're going to weigh the both the options. And whenever we do decide that we let everybody know that this is when it's going to start, just like uh, King Street, that we have constant communication. The residents really appreciate that, the notices, being informed when it's going to start and how long it takes. So um, very much appreciate that we're accessing all options and, and appreciate the feedback from the residents who would potentially be impacted by, you know, potentially five to eight week detour. So. Uh, this is a work in progress. Again, appreciate all the comments from everybody. Mayor Strathern. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I'm just wondering whether there's an opportunity for bonusing. Uh, I think they did this with the gardener down in the city of Toronto to accelerate either either option. And is this the point to be asking that question or is it something that comes up once you award it? Mr. Campbell. Uh, certainly that's uh, an option we can put into the uh, contract. Uh, we did that for the King Street project, uh, although it was a, a different type of project, but, you know, we, we can add that in and see if there's any uh, financial merit or if the contractors think there is a way, because typically that way is to work longer hours and longer hours, uh, we've already talked about that. Tonight. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. So, um, just to, so we're aware, there's no financial impact with regards to asking for a tender for closure or uh, or temporary closure and having an option to have it partially open. Is that correct, Mr. Campbell? Oh no, there's no financial consequence okay. to to this recommendation in the budget. When you see it yep. for uh, in February, we we do have to increase the budget for this project substantially because of the culvert. So you will see that. Uh, estimate and uh, you know then if the tender comes in at a different uh, value we'll make those adjustments uh, mid-year. I'm feeling that uh, we're probably going to uh, keep it open but uh, we'll see how the numbers come in. Um, last uh, word uh, Councillor Gordon. Thank you Mr. Campbell. Is there any option for a bypass? Um, you know I'm trying to think when culverts are replaced like I remember there was one on 93 they were doing just north of Hillsdale, um, they didn't close the highway. And it seemed like they, they weren't there to like forever either. They just kind of went in there and did it. It was one of those concrete preformed things. I don't know what's involved in this. I'm not an engineer, but is there another option that maybe it didn't uh, pitch to us? Cause you know, it either seems, seems too zany or, you know, like, is there any, any other option? A short of Campbell? complete shutdown or the massive costs of dragging it out? Well, the, the bypass is keeping one lane open. So I'm not sure, you know, there's no other road detour we could do through a greenfield area. So we're already looking at one lane, keeping two lanes open will likely be very disruptive. Uh, but uh, you know, again, we could, uh, I could talk to the engineering team about trying to keep two lanes open, but I think the amount of uh, land we would require from the adjoining property owners would be too significant. Uh, so, but again, if council wishes, we can put, I don't like to put too many options in a tender. Uh, so I think, I, I think it's, it. I think the, uh, you know, one lane or close completely is what I'm sort of getting the feeling, but we'll wait for that tender to come through. Is Thank there a, an option for a temporary bridge, like a steel drop in place bridge, you know, you can, cars can drive over that and all the people dig and work underneath and meanwhile stuff's happening like just a big drop a crane in there and drop a metal bridge how how what's the span we're talking about here do they have such a thing mr campbell our our budget increase uh, that i'll be asking for council is already over a half a million dollar increase so uh i can design and build anything you want if we want to put a bridge over top of it we can add millions of dollars more to the project uh, i don't see it feasible or economical 
No, sorry, I wasn't suggesting we build a bridge. I'm just wondering, do they make temporary, you know, like when they're working in Toronto, they drop these steel plates on the road. Meanwhile, they're working underneath it. You're driving over these one inch thick steel plates and the show goes on. I'm just wondering, is there any, any ability to do that or maybe something we haven't considered? Uh, underneath those is uh, they put sheet piling first. And if you wish, we can look at uh, doing uh, extensive sheet piling and reinforcement prior to that. Uh, the most one example is in, in on the 400, they've been two years uh, doing sheet piling and that sort of work you're talking about. Again, if uh, council wishes us to investigate uh, that sort of structure, it, it's feasible, it, it's doable, it just adds cost. Uh, so if council wishes, uh, no, I don't want to, I'm not suggesting it. anything that would add cost. I'm just looking for other let's, options that maybe I hadn't considered. So that's fair. I suggest we leave it to, sorry, that we leave it to uh, Mr. Campbell's capable hand if we choose to pass this and we'll see what comes back with regards to tenders. Is that fine with everybody? Yes. All those in favor? Is it a motion? So passed. Uh, well, next up, we'll have our CEO, uh, Mr. Dino, to have a corporate up. Uh, sorry, COVID nineteen update, Mr. Dino, and thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Ash, uh, Deputy Mayor, and to members of Council. I'll give you a, a brief update on certainly what's happening on the COVID front here in Midland at, and at Town Services. I think. As we're all aware, the uh, the news is not good, certainly for Midland and North Simcoe. You, I'm sure everyone has read the news with what's going on at uh, Georgian Bay General Hospital and and the impacts of that, which is quite concerning. And and uh, we'll continue to follow that. Uh, for the month of December in in Midland alone, we've seen our 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 numbers almost double, it, just in those first few days of December. So we've gone from up to 31 cases in, in Midland, 104 cases across all of North Simcoe. Our, our infection rate's about 17.3%. Just to give you some context, um, Barry, which is one of those hot areas, has an infection rate of about 52.5. So um, still relatively low, but uh, I think it just speaks to how, how rapid this virus moves. It is lightning fast, as, as, as many people have said, and you just need one infection to really impact the community. So we're certainly seeing that in Midland today. So lots of um, caution being um, offered in terms of, of what's happening. Uh, I think a lot of us are, are suspecting that, you know, the red, the red zone isn't very far away from us. I think the province will make that determination potentially um, by the end of this week, certainly, if you look at the epidemiological numbers that we have for Simcoe Muskoka, our um, virus rates above that red zone. So we're at about 46, almost 47. And for the red zone, that, it, that indicator is about 40. Our uh, reproduction number is at about 1.5 right now. And again, the red zone is at 1.2. So we're about, we're at, we're above the red zone in both those indicators. There are other factors that will be considered, but certainly on those two, uh, we're not headed in the right direction. So that's that's certainly concerning. The big the big concern as well is obviously uh, long term health care and also the impact on our our public health system, the capacity to to do the work that they need to. Um, one of the impacts, and again, I'm just uh, passing along the message that we're hearing from uh, the health unit is. As as we as a as a populace, we've been much more active. I think we've all been trying to be cautious in what we're doing, but I think the masks may have um, created a bit of a false sense of security and made people much more active. The results of that is really impacting the public health system because the contact tracing takes so long to do because there are so many interactions that they now have to trace since people are much more active than they have been in the past. So, you know, in terms of making an appeal to the public, I'd say certainly over the holidays, if people can, start, can again, try to stay away from crowds, try to stay calm, like quiet uh, and restrict their movements as much as possible, that would certainly help in containing the virus, but also in, in being able to manage the, the uh, contact tracing efforts. 
So that's that's kind of the situation, uh, um, certainly from a Midland uh, standpoint in terms of what the virus uh, risk factors are. We'll continue to watch that and prepare accordingly. Uh, at the town, we've been making lots of adjustments. It's one of those busy periods when, um, you know, things are happening on the COVID front that, that take up a lot of time. And, and we've certainly had lots of instructions come down from the health unit. So there's about 16 different uh, uh, pieces of instruction we had to go through this past week to make sure we had active screening in place at all of our sites. We needed to put a compliance officer in place to make sure that we were monitoring those things. We also did a review of our process with our community uh, control group that we have and our emergency management group, but which I think has been doing a fantastic job in, in kind of managing, managing our decisions and approvals uh, with this process, but, but we want to make sure we're, we're paying attention to it and improving it. So uh, we'll take a look at that for the start of next year and make any adjustments accordingly. Uh, so that's certainly part of the work that's been happening um, in terms of events, I think we all saw the participation, you know, at the tree lighting event, it's the event behind me in the virtual background that was, I thought, uh, was, was nicely done virtually. Uh, we had the King Street opening, which, you know, we did in a bit of a stage, but, you know, we got that whole thing opened and we're making adjustments uh, to that whole environment and uh, the reverse parade, which, you know, was quite popular. Uh, certainly learned a lot from it, but again, it was an opportunity for us to celebrate in a safe way. So, uh, you know, those those new things that, that we're trying to make sure we pay attention to. Uh, a lot of our work as well is anticipating what could happen if we do go red, because a lot of our services and a lot of the businesses in this community will obviously be affected when you contract the number of people that can be in spaces. So we have to look at those services and what could potentially happen with them and make sure our the, the people using those services understand how that could uh, impact things like recreational events or, or anything else that might be using our facilities. So that continues to go um, to happen, you know, uh, throughout the day. There'll be a meeting with the health unit tomorrow to get an update from Dr. Gardner with the rest of the CAOs and, and certainly we'll be watching the news uh, should it break uh, over the weekend or hopefully before then. Um, but just want to assure you that we're doing everything we can to make sure that we are uh, only offering things when it's safely able to do so. Um, I certainly appreciate, you know, the patience of everyone who, who uses our facilities or wants to use them. We are trying to do things uh, as quickly and as effectively as possible. We're doing it within the guidelines that we have them and the guidelines that we're anticipating. So both those are, 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 can be unknown factors at some time. But thank you for the support of the councillors who continue to provide us the feedback that we need to make those good decisions and your support to, to all the staff who are trying to, to do the best job we can. Um, we'd welcome any questions you have though. Thank you very much, Mr. Dill. And uh, I'm gonna remind that we got a little off topic last meeting. So uh, if we could please only ask COVID-19 related questions, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Councillor Cunningham. I swear this is completely salient. Did you know, Mr. CAO, I have this on good authority that during the Santa Claus parade, due to COVID, there have been so few that the real Santa Claus was in our parade. My four-year-old grandson actually can verify that for you because he felt the magic when we drove through that parade. So I think it's very important that we make sure that people know that there, there was a silver lining that Santa was here for our parade, not just one of his helpers. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> yes, Wonderful news. Deputy Mayor, I can confirm Santa was there. Wonderful. Oh, well, that is great news. And uh, hope, make sure all you kids stay well and on the good list. Just as Counselor, a follow up, I do want to just follow up if I could. Sure, please. Um, there have been a, a lot of thank yous. I've talked to a few local business people and in fact, a downtown merchant who said the Santa Claus parade did bring the spirit of Christmas downtown. And there's a lot of gratitude for that. And one of those merchants mentioned that he hit about 75% of the Santa Claus parade income during the Santa Claus parade this year. So that is astounding. And thank you so much for getting behind that measure. I just want to feel it's important to share that it has made a difference and certainly it's very appreciated. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Gordon and then I'll go to Councillor Main. 
Thanks. I want to echo what Councillor Cunningham just said. I too have been contacted by business owners downtown. Um, I tried to get into the lineup to go through this myself, but it was all the way to 93. Like <laughs> the, the turnout was incredible. And, and you know, it wasn't just Midland people. It was the word got out far and wide that we, we were not one of the uh, uh, communities that, you know, chose to forego this, this year. And, and we found a creative way. And I got, I got to tell you, Mr. Dino, this that was your, your baby. You coined the term reverse pride. I never heard it in my life. And uh, you know, we ran with it. And you guys pulled it off. I can't take any credit whatsoever for it. So um, absolute, you know, congratulations to the staff and a big thanks to all the volunteers who made it. I get it from, you know, wasn't as big a parade as, as ever, but, you know, some people are concerned about dying and catching COVID. So you can't blame them for wanting to stay home or stay safe in their cars. So good on them. Good on the town. Um, to the people that, you know, couldn't make it through because the lineup was so long. I can promise you that if, if, for, by some horrid chance, we have to repeat this next year, and I'm, you know, we're hoping we're not, it's not going to happen. Um, we can do things to Don't try and streamline the uh, streamline the traffic. Like there's there's stuff we could do. We just didn't. I don't think anybody expected the turnout. So anyway, 100% on the staff. Thank you for for making this happen. It it was very meaningful to the people that made it, and even the people that didn't weren't upset when they were pinging me. They were just shocked at how crazy busy it was and, and the downtown merchants really other than wishing we'd done it on king street of course um we're all very positive so hopefully this is a one-off we put it behind us but uh the credit goes entirely to the staff and uh, i hand it to you guys you guys knocked it out of the park so right on if i may deputy mayor just uh, i did not coin, coin the term the reverse parade I, I i did hear about it early in in some COVID discussions and i did simply bring it forward to the town saying, listen, can we, can we make something happen? And, and the town staff led by Nicole Major deserves all the credit for pulling this off. So uh, uh, great kudos to them. They worked very hard with the, with the health uh, unit to make sure we could do this safely. We, we brought a couple plans to them. The first one didn't meet snuff, so we, we went at them again. Um, we canceled some performers who were from red zones who were you know, going to be part of that, uh, that um, static parade that we had. So uh, uh, just a great job in, in kind of responding to how things change through the planning process and still being able to pull it off. So I'll make sure that that team you know, gets all the, uh, the gratitude that's been expressed. Yeah, and congratulations, a lot of smiling, happy kids. So that's what it's all about. And we can't say enough about that. So thank you to all the staff and, uh, and Mr. Dino for putting that together. And Ms. Majors, of course. Thank you so much. Councillor Main, I saw you had a question. Thank you, yeah, on a little bit more of a serious note. Um, I guess the number one story, uh, the biggest concern for everyone uh, in town is the hospital outbreak. I mean, when it, news broke Friday night, I mean, try to reach out to anyone I knew in the hospital to send, you know, uh, well wishes. Um, and I guess the question is, uh, I, you know how serious it is when that hospital is sending out communication saying, we urge you not to go out unless for essentials. Um, so the question is, what can the community and what can we do to help the hospital? Uh, it, as they say, we're following the communications, which are greatly appreciated. The hospital is still op op uh, operational, it's still functioning. Uh, obviously, they're going to cut back certain things. They had a great success with their Giving Tuesday effort last week. I think they raised over $30,000. Is there anything else that the hospital is saying that we can do and support except follow all the COVID uh, provisions? Yeah, th through you, Deputy Mayor. You know, I'll, I'll give you the context of uh, uh, you know, the comments, certainly what I've heard from health healthcare professionals. I have some in my family, actually. And, and certainly their appeal their appeal to me as, as just a citizen is, please, please take this seriously. Please limit your, your involvement. Um, you know, if I could paraphrase them, they are exhausted, exhausted, just getting ready, putting their PPE equipment on, taking it off every day, cleaning. I mean, all of that has just left them exhausted, let alone dealing with, you know, the patients they have to. And, you know, I have a, a sister who's a hero to me. She's, she's a, a physician and she has to break news to people that she barely knows, but she has to treat so many of them, you know, because of how fast this thing spreads. So it's, it's a quite, 
it's quite a difficult situation they're in. So anything we can do to, to minimize the impact on the healthcare system, you know, I know it's, it's not easy to not be active, but do it, do it. And I actually went on the GVGH website today and I saw a little, a little, uh, you know, bar there that I could click and send a well wish, you know, a complimentary message to the staff there. And I did that on behalf of the administration. Everybody can do that because they will see those things. You know, I think they make, you know, it, it resonates with people just to, just to see those thank yous. The same with those placards that you see on people's lawns. That means something. They're, not, they're put there for a reason because everyone does appreciate the, our essential workers. Um, so those little things help, but I think the best thing we can do is try and, and stay virus free. You know, do all those things that are necessary. This might be a little off topic, but is there any way uh, due to this holiday season that we could send a gift basket or a fruit basket up to the hospital from the people of Midland? I don't know if there's any budget or something, if we need a staff approval or a council approval, but it would be a nice gesture to send, uh, you know, something little just to say from the people of Midland that uh, we definitely appreciate all you're doing and have a fruit basket on us. Happy to a take that away. A couple hundred dollars would be fantastic. Happy and to take that away. We'll make it happen. Thank you. Councillor May, sorry, follow up? Yeah, just a, uh, um, just a quick update. I took my son to get uh, COVID tested. He had a sore throat. The nurse said, you know, you might want to go get tested. So uh, it's really streamlined. The assessment center, they have an online a booking appointment. You go in, it's super in and out. They do a really good job uh, at the standalone building on St. Andrews Drive. So that's the question for you, Mr. Noe, is are we hearing anything else uh, from the health unit of the hospital about, uh, you know, go get tested, even if you're asymptomatic? Like I'm I'm assuming that's the same uh, recommendation that we've had all along that go get tested if you've been in contact with somebody. Is there anything update to that, that uh, uh, the health unit or the hospital is recommending that uh, people in the community uh, get additional testing or? Yeah, no, I, I haven't heard anything about additional testing. I think the instructions are still get tested if you think you need to be tested. Don't get tested if, if there's no reason for you to, to get tested. It's not, oh, Let's not uh, use the you know fragile capacity we have in that system just to to get a test to make you feel better. You know if there's a reason for you to get tested, you know make it happen. You know I think um, I saw the turnaround rate. I think almost 87 percent or 87 percent of of the testing uh, is done and, and the results are delivered in one day. You know they're they're doing this quite rapidly, but it again it's a very fragile system. They're adding more people to do the contact tracing because they have to, because of you know, that, that um, impact that I told you about so many people being active, it just takes longer. So they are trying to scale up in terms of how they can do the contact tracing. Um, but to get, through, to get through this winter and through the Christmas is gonna be you know, a really important part for us. I think we've all heard the vaccine news, which is you know, optimistic. Hopefully rapid testing will be you know, something else that we can do, which I think will really help alleviate the situation. Um, but, but to get to those kind of two factors, we need to get through this period, which is, you know, gonna be difficult based on the trending that we're seeing. Thank you. Mayor Strathern. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, given the indicators are that we may go to red as early as Friday or Monday, um, what can residents expect in terms of access to municipal services and facilities sure. so to this building or to the rec center and so on. Yeah, the, um, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, to, uh, to his worship and, and the rest of council, the, the big um, impact of going to red is the restriction on the number of people that can be in enclosed spaces and outdoor spaces. So unfortunately, this could impact places like restaurants, um, you know, with the, with the number of people that could be seated at an indoor facility. They could still offer takeout food, but to offer indoor seating or even for uh, retailers, that could be a bit of an impact. The same with our services. It um, uh, certainly our rec center, the amount of people that you can have in that facility will be restricted. It may be restricted to a point where some of the, the leagues that are having some games may not find it uh, viable. For them to continue so we're we're having those discussions with them at town hall we're going to have the discussion with our control group 
should we go red on whether we go back to uh, by appointment only services. You know, and we'll make sure we communicate that. But again, it's part of take, we feel taking that leadership position where, where we want people to know that you can still get your services, that you can get it in an effective manner by making a scheduled appointment rather than being out and about, uh, you know, socializing, which may not be the best thing to do when you're in this type of a category. So we're going to have that discussion as a group, and uh, certainly um, the mayor and deputy mayor are part of it. We can can participate on that decision. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for uh, Mr. Dino? Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate the the update, and uh, hopefully uh, everyone will be safe and follow the instruction from uh, County of uh, Sorry Simcoe Muskoka Health Unit. Please uh, wear your mask, wash your hands, and social distance, please. Uh, next up, we have notice of motion, and I'll turn it over to you, Your Worship. I understand you have a, the first motion. You're on mute. I'm on mute, there we go. Um, uh, there's a, an initiative from the federal government called the Rapid Housing Initiative. Uh, Castor Gordon and his group are aware of it. Uh, it deals with federal government putting funds, a uh, billion dollars worth of funds into uh, creating uh, housing um, quickly. Takes two for, it's administered by CMHC uh, and then through the uh, applications go to CMHC. Uh, in our case, the applications would go forward from Simcoe County as the housing authority for this area. Um, so uh, basically it would take the form of either motel acquisitions or uh, modular building out modular units, micro, uh, micro suites. Um, in order to get this on the agenda, this has just come up. Uh, the county has asked us to support two applications, potentially from Midland to CMHC um, and uh, uh, some uh, applications from Barry as well. Uh, they need to be in by the end of this month, and this, so this is the only opportunity we'll have as a group to say that we either do or do not support this initiative. I suspect we will. So I need uh, from you um, the ability to bring it onto this agenda, which means a two-thirds vote to amend the agenda. And I'll, I guess the deputy mayor would ma manage that in this portion of the meeting. Yes, uh, we, um, you heard your request. We need a two thirds vote. We are allow, uh, would uh, council allow the amendment of the motion and I would need a minimum of six votes to allow this to happen. I'm seeing uh, all in favor, your worship. So please proceed if you'd like to bring the motion onto the floor. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's moved by myself. I'll be happy to second it, sir. Thank you, second by deputy mayor. Uh, whereas the County of Simcoe, uh, Simcoe's Our Community 10-Year Affordable Housing and Homelessness Prevention Strategy has a target to create 2,685 units across the county by 2024. This includes a Midland target of 90 units and a North Simcoe target of 230 units. And whereas the 2018 enumeration of people experiencing homelessness ranked Midland as the second highest in the County of Simcoe, 22% of the overall total, and whereas there is a need for permanent affordable housing as well as transitional and or supportive housing in Midland. Now, th therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Midland hereby supports the County of Simcoe's application for funding under the Federal Rapid Housing Initiative to enable the county to create or support the creation of by nonprofit groups of housing for those in severe housing need and that the Town of Midland would look to interpret planning documents as flexibly as possible expedite approvals and waive associated planning and development fees in order to facilitate any necessary planning permissions to support development of new projects or acquisition of existing buildings under the RHI, recognizing that projects must be completed within 12 months of commitment under the RHI. So basically, as I understand it, there are two projects that will go forward uh, through the county. This uh, resolution, uh, puts the weight of council behind that application. 
uh, and it will go out with just a cover letter to to uh, to the county transiting from us our uh, approval or not of this uh, I suspect it will be yes uh, this this initiative it's good news uh, the county is uh, keen to uh, we're just in touch with staff again today um, and uh, it's uh, great news for, for the homelessness uh, effort as well as you know filling in that continuum of need in the community so I would really recommend that we uh, vote in favor of this and then county can get down to the brass tacks of making it happen on our behalf and on behalf of those who really need this sort of uh, program. So that's where we're at with this. Thank more. you very much, Your Worship, for bringing that forward. Any questions or comments with regards to this motion? Councillor Gordon? No brainer. You're well said. Uh, any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Congratulations, Your Worship. Uh, that's a unanimous uh, decision. Well done. Congratulations, Council. It's uh, yes. hopefully the beginning of a whole new um, initiative for us. Thank you very Thank much. I'll, we'll now move on to uh, general announcements. Any announcements coming forward from Council? I'll start with Councillor Gordon. Thank you very much. Uh, first off uh, is an apology. Um, it's not another snowflake apology, don't worry. This is this is a, another one. Um, so the first Homelessness Action Committee met earlier this month and I was unable to attend the inaugural Homelessness Action Committee. And I felt like such an absolute schmuck that I could not be there, but I did watch it on YouTube and it was fantastic. And Councillor Prost, uh, I mean, I believe C Councillor McGinn couldn't make it either. She had a work conflict. It's just a terrible, I won't get into why it was, uh, I certainly wasn't, you know, like willingly not there. I just couldn't be there because of my work commitment. But Councillor Prost uh, accurately reflected all the concerns that we had in forming the, the mandate for the committee and led the, it was great. It was, watch it, it's on YouTube if you want to see it. The participants um, all shared their experiences and, and uh, some learning was going on. Uh, there wasn't necessarily, there was only really one action item, one takeaway, and that was to include the guest house at the next meeting uh, so we could get some input from them and also put some questions to them. Uh, so the thing got rolling with momentum basically under Councillor Prost's leadership So and, and, our, and our members, which are awesome. So anyway, I just wanted to apologize to anybody who may have noticed, um, especially in the news article that, you know, called out the conspicuous absence of uh, two of us and that it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't, I can't speak for Councillor again, but I know she has a legit reason um, I was there in spirit and I dutifully watched it that evening after apologizing and I sent an email apology to each of the members of the committee separately because I'm not allowed to do mass communication. Um, but I just wanted to let you know and formally acknowledge that. So I'm really looking forward to our next meeting, which is late January and there'll be a regular cadence. And I have scheduled that time off and by God, I'll book vacation if I have to, to make be at those. So I just wanted to call that out and uh, acknowledge that I wasn't there but that uh, the good work kicked off and, and it was on Councillor Prost's shoulders. So kudos to you, Councillor Prost, for that. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. And uh, thank I had you another one. Prost. Sorry, I had, I had oh, one Okay, more. I apologize. Keep going, I, sir. It's not another apology. So this one uh, got forwarded to uh, Councillor Cunningham and I, and uh, you know we, we threw lots on who was going to do it, and uh, I got it. So um, basically, an idea is being circulated uh, to try and express support for all of our first responders and frontline workers battling COVID-19, uh, you know, the health response that they've been doing. And I know there's been many type gestures like leaving your light on or turn this on or bang your pots, uh, but this is something similar like that. And what's being suggested is that we try and as a community, get as much noise happening on January 1st, so the first day of 2021, when we totally wish there was no COVID to drag from 2020 into 2021, at four o'clock PM, so that's 4 p.m. on January 1st. Uh, everyone will be sober by then. And uh, get outside and bang something, make noise, honk a horn. Uh, you know, the noise bylaw will have a, a three or four minute window of forgiveness. That would be my suggestion. And uh, maybe the bells will ring on the church. And just to, to make some noise for those five minutes to let everybody know that we are, you know, we're ringing in a new year and uh, supporting the efforts to try and eradicate COVID-19. So that was, that's not my thing. I'm just pitching it. Uh, I'll get out there and do it. Um, so it was a person named Pat 
I don't want to embarrass them and read their whole letter out there, but I committed to doing the announcement uh, tonight. So I wanted to. And my last little piece is a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to everybody because we won't see you until the New Year. On behalf of me, I'm sure it will go around the table. But uh, anyway, don't worry about tonight and the, the drama and integrity and all that stuff. Uh, we're still working together. Life is good. Life goes on. Learn. We all learn. I'll try not to be stupid anymore. And uh, we'll see if that works for the new year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll move on to Councillor Cunningham. Then I'll go to your worship. Thank you very much, your, your Deputy Mayor. Um, it is the season. Happy holidays. I love my local. Uh, so I'd like to challenge anybody who is on Facebook to go to edit their profile picture and add a frame. When they add the frame, look for EDCNS and you will find four different frames created by the talented Veronique that allow you to encourage others to shop local and love their local. Even if you don't celebrate any of the winter holidays, just celebrate the fact that King Street is open again and go buy gifts. Um, I was able to go downtown to do some shopping on the Santa Claus Parade Day myself, stopped into Minds Alive and did all my toy shopping there went into the Elegant Gourmet. I've still got three or four more shops in order to meet some more people on my list and I'm looking for inspiration. So if you are shopping in the Midland area or anywhere in North Simcoe, share where you are shopping and use the hashtag, I love my local. So you can inspire me to buy the hard to buy for people like men, teenage boys, my husband, my son, my brother. I mean, Please, I love my local is the hashtag, and it really is the season to support our local merchants. Well, I was in Taylor and Company on Saturday, and I'd be happy with anything they have there. So if you're looking for my gift, uh, Councillor Cunningham, uh, anything from Taylor and Company would be fine. I would think so. I, we are also <laughs> compiling a gift list on ilovemylocal.ca. So if you know merchants who are selling some great products, let them know to go to ilovemylocal.ca and share their top two or three best hot sellers this season. I do leave it till the last minute, so I'll keep watching. Good they for you. A couple of those online. Good for you. Councillor uh, Maine, and then I'll have to go to Councillor, uh, sorry, Mayor Strathern. Thank you. I just wanted to give a quick shout out and thank you to all the people downtown who've uh, uh, made downtown just look amazing. Obviously, we're celebrating the, the construction, the rejuvenation, uh, but there's lots of love and appreciation to all the artists that did the window painting. Um, even Sun Sports uh, downtown, they have an amazing little miniature window display. Uh, BI put the wreaths up uh, the other day. I, I guess snowflakes are going up uh, soon as well. So I just want to say thank you to all those people downtown making a uh, making downtown look really festive and special. And I know that there was a breath, a sigh of relief uh, once uh, all the gates and construction was lifted and it's great to see uh, King Street back to the new normal and hopefully next year we'll get back to the old normal. So uh, thank you. Thanks for everyone downtown. Thank you, Councilor Main. Uh, Mayor Strether. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'd just like to say I had a wonderful time on Dominion Street uh, for as long as it's likely to last. Um, I still not used to that stoplight there, uh, but I would really I would like to congratulate uh, Mayor George Cornell on his acclamation for a second term as warden of Simcoe County. I'd also like to congratulate Deputy Mayor Ross for his um, being voted by his peers to the position of vice chair for corporate services for the county. And uh, there's a lot goes into each one of these. Uh, management areas or business business areas within the county there are three of them and um, it's a compliment i think to deputy mayor ross that his peers chose him to be the vice chair of uh what's a fairly important uh, uh, endeavor within the county structure so congratulations thank you very much your worship uh, very nicely said and i greatly appreciate it and it is truly an honor to represent uh, uh my peers at county council so Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Prost. Hi, I don't have an announcement, but this is such a nice ending to this meeting. 
And I want to say Merry Christmas to all of you, to all of Midland staff, all of Midland residents, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Well said. Any other announcements? If I could, I had a, a, a couple. And um, unfortunately, a couple are on a sad note. And uh, the town of Midland, unfortunately, lost a couple of great men uh, since the last time we met. One being uh, Mr. George Dunn. My condolences go out to the Dunn family. George was uh, quite the gentleman in town and uh, did a lot for Meyer hockey and uh, raised a great family and was a wonderful person. And uh, I, I, one of my best friends is her da his daughter and uh, it truly is a sad day. And I wanna pass along my condolences. And secondly, and definitely not last and not least, sorry, uh, we lost Mayor Ted Simmons. Ted was the mayor of Midland uh, for two terms. He was a true leader of this community and he'll be dearly missed. So uh, my condolences go out to the Simmons family. Sims, <laughs> Simmons family, sorry. And, and uh, last but not least, I was uh, had the pleasure of shopping downtown uh, on Saturday. I took my mother and thought we would, uh, and I love, I use uh, Councillor Cunningham's term. I've used it all over town and I thank you for it. Put your money where your merchants are. I love it and I say it all the time. But uh, I went into the crow's nest and I was so sad to see that we're losing a true icon from the 70s in, in Midland are closing down. I guess somebody bought the building and they have some changes that they'd like to uh, do with it and that's their right. And uh, But unfortunately, uh, new progress is changing our downtown and uh, the crow's nest, thank you for uh, 40 plus years of service to the people of Midland, uh, you'll be dearly missed. Uh, and with that said, I would like to wish everyone happy Hanukkah starts tomorrow at sundown and uh, Merry Christmas and a happy new year. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Main? I just wanted to quickly uh, piggyback on the uh, condolences for the uh, past mayor, Ted Simmons. Um, George McDonald uh, spoke so highly of uh, Ted Simmons and he so, used, to talk, used to talk about how he was so punctual. The meeting started at seven, whether people were stirring about uh, and George, you will be missed as well. Uh, one story I wanted to share with everyone is uh, Ted is also known as an amazing sailor. Uh, my dad, when he moved to Midland in the 80s, used to crew with uh, Ted and they used to drive around all over the province and they nearly made it to the 1984 Olympics. They were fourth or fifth in uh, you know, the Canadian regatta in Kingston. And it was a highlight of my dad's of sailing with Ted and they had so much fun. And I know all the guys down at the sailing club is he's going to be a legendary sailor that's going to be missed. So I wanted to share that because not every day uh, does Midland produce a near Olympiad. So Ted is a magnificent man with a lot of talents. Great, great story, Councillor Bain. Thanks for sharing. Uh, any other uh, announcements? Thank oh, Mayor Strathern, the last word is yours. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I just I forgot to mention that the mayor of Aurelia was in town today and uh, advised me that of all the main streets he's been on and uh, he's seeing being redeveloped and so on, this is the best he's seen by far. And so he was very congratulatory of town of Midland and the wonderful job they've done. And I would be remiss if I didn't pass that on. And uh, I did forget to say, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, all the best in the new year. Hopefully we'll all have two shots in the arm before January's out, but we'll see. Uh, thanks and, for I, that. and I'd love to hear from Mr. Uh, Mayor Clark of Aurelia. If anyone knows, Mayor Clark grew, went to MSS and uh, raised in Port Nichols, so you can't get that North Simcoe out of his blood. He even uh, comes back. Of course, we have the best Main Street. And thank you very much, uh, Mayor Clark, for that. Um, I'll have the last motion of the evening on my end, moved by Councillor McGinn. Unfortunately, Councillor McGinn's not with us. Uh, change to Councillor Gordon, if that's all right. Council, moved by Councillor Gordon. Second by Councilor Ocheski at the Committee of the Whole Rise and Report. All those in favor? So moved. Oh, there's, sorry, there, there's another uh, motion. Or oh, that, that's, that's coming oh, next. That comes in a formal session. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah no bad. problem. Carry on. So moved. Your Worship, it's all yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I have here a motion moved by Councilor Pro, seconded by Councilor Main, that the recommendations of the Committee of the Whole for the meeting of December 9th, 2020, be adopted as resolutions of council. Council, you've heard the motion, comments or questions? 
Seeing none, all in favor. Thank you, that carries. The next item uh, on the agenda is uh, notices of motion. Sorry, motions for which notice was given, I beg your pardon. Uh, I have one here, so I'll turn it back to the deputy mayor for a moment. No, go go right ahead if you'd like to put it on the floor and I'll uh, answer any questions or take it from there. Thank you. Um, so the motion basically uh, uh, is, it deals with Bosley First Nation, a request for support of funding application. Originally, the request was for a letter from the mayor's office, which I was quite happy, would be quite happy to provide. But I suggested uh, the a resolution from this council would carry more weight. Uh, and basically, I, th I thought that this council would likely uh, given our relationship with uh, the Indigenous peoples here, with Bosley First Nation in particular, want to express support as, as a group. So it's uh, here tonight. Uh, I'll, if I may, Deputy Mayor, I'll read it. Please. Uh, it's uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Prost, if she's willing. Thank you. That. Whereas Bosley First Nation continues to operate essential services for its community, and whereas Bosley First Nation seeks to eliminate the overrepresentation of Indigenous women facing life threatening gender based violence in our communities, and whereas Bosley First Nation Chief and Council supports and endorses a community based initiative through the development of a 24 hour emergency shelter for women and children in coordination with family violence prevention programs. And whereas Bosley First Nation is submitting a funding application to the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation to fund said shelter that will be accessible to their community members, as well as First Nations in our geographic area. Therefore, be it resolved that Council of the Town of Midland supports the efforts of Bosley First Nation to create a 24 hour shelter for Indigenous women and strongly urges Canada Mortgage, sorry, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation to fund their application. Uh, they are, there are 10 potential sites in Canada that will be funded. They are a strong contender, I understand, for one of those sites. And this will, I think, go a long way to supporting that. Thank you very much, Your Worship, for bringing forward. Any questions or comments with regards to this item? I'm seeing none. All those in favor? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Councillor Main had a question. Councillor Main? All right, just a quick comment. Uh, this is very timely. Obviously, uh, a few days ago is the uh, anniversary of the Polytechnic Massacre, which is, uh, it, we always try to, uh, every year, raise awareness against violence against women. I mean, obviously, that's in the news, uh, the, the Young Street vehicle ramming attack, which was uh, basically a domestic terrorist attack uh, based on violence against women. Uh, so it's just so important that we continue to call out that it's just not acceptable and that town of Midland is here to support uh, the Bosley First Nation on their efforts. Um, so thank you. Well said, Councillor Maine. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? So moved. Well done, Your Worship. I'll move it, pass it back over to you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, we now have a um, Motion uh, moved by Councillor Gordon. Councillor Gordon. Thank you. So this uh, this is what I was alluding to earlier. I mean, this is a motion driven by members of the community and actually the co-chair of the Active Transportation Committee um, advanced this to me as something that a lot of people are passionate about. And I'd mentioned it already as well, I think at our last meeting. So what I'm seeking for support on is that council support the additional snow clearing activities required to open the Little Lake Park waterfront walking trail for recreational activity. And while we find ourselves potentially, you know, wandering into the grip of uh, a red lockdown uh, and there are more restrictions on where people can go, there has yet to ever be restrictions on people just walking trails and stuff in parkland. And since we have a, uh, no anticipation of that happening and we have opened up Little Lake Park for vehicular traffic for the first time in decades, the, it would seem a little unrealistic to expect people to walk along Little Lake Park Road as there's vehicles traveling and sightseeing, perhaps not you know, paying as much attention as they could normally. So we have this beautiful flat trail that runs along the waterfront. And at anticipation is hopefully we can get some budget to do the, the lights in Little Lake Park for next holiday season, which will entail people walking on that trail. So what I'd like uh, council to support 
is some additional snow clearing activities. We're not talking runner right down to the, the asphalt uh, and salt the hell out of it, or you know, try and make this into something expensive and difficult to manage, but just something that other than an unkept path with just feet marks on it, so that people can walk their dogs and enjoy nature and breathe non-virus filled air and get out of their homes. And that uh, you know, ability to enjoy Little Lake Park, I would imagine come, will come at some expense because it is you know, taking the sideway pl sidewalk plow and running it down a path and burn some more diesel or whatever the thing burns. But uh, I'd like to see this happen. I, I know a lot of residents would like to see it happen. And I'd really like to hear from staff on whether this is a very onerous ask or if it's something that's quite easy to do. Um, and I think would be appreciated by, by our residents that enjoy our beautiful park. That's the pitch. Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor Gordon. Uh, so the motion, find it here. There we go. Moved by Councillor Gordon. Do I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Prost. Um, that council support the additional snow clearing activities required to open Little Lake Park waterfront walking trail for recreational activity. Comments or questions from council? Councillor Cunningham, then Councillor Olszewski. Thank you. Mayor. I do think that Councillor Gordon raises a salient point when he asks whether this is onerous. I know there are, this has come up and this is going to come up year after year about how much sidewalk we can clear, clear effectively, clear, clear efficiently so that people can go about their daily tasks, get to school, get to church, get to the shops and the banks. And with our current situation of having an expanded set of sidewalks, I know we have a, a fab, fabulous request from Bayport that they would like to have that walking path with all the construction in there still going on all winter. They really don't have great places to walk. Could we clear the trail part that leads to the road? And there's a lot more to just clearing an extra piece we have to treat it like a sidewalk with all of the risks and liabilities and ice and danger. And so this is a conversation that's been going back and forth via email for the past week around the Bayport piece. Can we just open up another trail? First of all, from a liability standpoint, from a snow blowing standpoint, the snow blowing across lakes, Little Lake versus uh, Midland Bay Lake, they both blow extra snow in, making it harder to keep those clear from a health and safety standpoint and a liability standpoint. So I think this is a topic that Andy Campbell has already been um, speaking to a great deal. And I think that would be the number one question with the additional sidewalks we need to clear up on Highway 93, with the current state of our sidewalk clearing and their number of sidewalk plows and hours involved what can we realistically do to help our residents get additional walking safe, consistent walking time outside on the sidewalks and trails in our area? Councillor uh, Oshesky, please. Uh, thank you very much. I, I certainly just like to Echo what Councillor uh, Cunningham is saying. I think a uh, simple comment from Mr. Campbell uh, verifying whether or not this is a huge job. I know I just had to get my driveway requoted to get it uh, plowed for the for the winter, and most of the quotes were over two thousand dollars for the season. So if it costs that much to do my driveway, um, anyway, I'll leave it up to the uh, professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um... Uh, Mr. Campbell, do you want to respond to that at this point, or shall we wait for Councillor Main? I, I can start your worship with a comment for consideration. Okay. Uh, right now, the town owns five sidewalk plows, and we use four to do the work we, we do today. That fifth one is uh, our spare for breakdowns, and it's used very regularly because we do have breakdowns uh, with our older equipment. Uh, just this winter alone, we've added new sidewalk out on Highway 93 that the county has constructed. Uh, that is taking about an extra three hours of, of clearing time. And all the new bollards uh, that we put along King Street 
King Street uh, is taking, it's gone from four hours of clearing to do the sidewalks on King Street downtown. It took eight hours after the snowfall last week. Now, part of that is it's uh, first snowfall, big snowfall of the year. So staff are, you know, got a little bit uh, uh, new learning curve every year. And also all those bollards, they have to learn how to um, work around those. But between just those two additions this winter that we're dealing with, that's adding almost eight hours a day of extra capacity and taking up the spare capacity we do have. I understand there's requests uh, for, you know, more sidewalks to be cleared, uh, but I'd like to very specifically address Councillor Gordon's comment that we don't really have to do the perfect job on the sidewalk. Under minimum maintenance standards under the province of Ontario, we're required to maintain every piece of sidewalk to the same standard. And we, you know, and we have 48 hours after a snowstorm or snow, snow event to do that clearing by law. So we can't uh, pick a sidewalk and not give it the same care and treatment and salting and sanding that any other sidewalk does. So I just like to make those comments as you consider the, the debate. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, I have uh, Councillor Main, then I'll go back to Councillor Gordon. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, that was the one question that I was going to ask. Is I don't know the minimum maintenance. I know that it exists. I don't know the, the finer details of it. And uh, I guess the question is: Is there a difference between pathways and sidewalks? And do they have different levels of service in terms of snow clearing? Because that's what I think we're trying to move towards is kind of a, a, this has a recreational trail as opposed to the high standard of a sidewalk. But if that's not, if there's not flexibility in the minimum state standards act, then obviously we don't have the wiggle room. Uh, and then the other question is, is there a possibility to say have, instead of all winter, you extended season. So, you know, you do a little bit more plowing in October, maybe November, and then, you know, when it, real heavy snow comes that we just let it get snowed in for January, February, uh, and then come back when it starts, uh, you know, softening up in March, April, and we kind of do a, a, a I don't know what you call it, like a soft opening or, or a little bit of snow maintenance at the shoulder seasons, as opposed to the whole uh, opening it all through the wintertime. Uh, through your worship, we, we have the option to close sidewalks. Uh, because when we when we have to post a sign saying that we are not providing maintenance on that sidewalk, so a sidewalk is either open or closed. And uh, uh, as of uh, last winter, uh, we did not close any. I think there. I don't think we closed any sidewalks last winter. We which in the past, uh, the town was closed. If there are sidewalks on two sides of the road, the town was only clearing one side of the road. Uh, we have last winter, that was one change of service that we, we internalized was to do both sides. Uh, and again, if I would, I would think if council wishes to consider trails in, in Little Lake Park and Bayport, uh, potentially the rest of the trails, I think that would be a discussion for budget because we would have to uh, get extra staff and uh, uh, another sidewalk plow. And a sidewalk plow, by the way, is $150,000 to, to buy a new sidewalk plow. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Councillor Gordon. Thanks. I mean, I, the minimum standards, that's that's good to know. I didn't realize because we haven't been plowing that. So it's I guess it's only a standard if you start to plow it. Is that the concept? And because I believe we have been plowing some of the rotary, not the rotary trail, but the uh, Trans Canada Trail, at, like behind Aberdeen, to some degree, but it hasn't been going right down to the wood. It's, or maybe it has been, but I mean, I get, I'm just a little conflicted on how we decide what we're gonna do and to what standard, because clearly we're doing it in some places in town, and and you know, not others now. Yes, and, and for the, the, the trail behind Aberdeen, we are not clearing the full width. We don't have to clear the entire three meters. We have, if we are opening the sidewalk, we have to clear uh, the minimum, uh, you know, four feet, one, one width of the blade. Uh, it, and if you look uh, in Little Lake Park, there is a sign at the, when you enter the park, uh, at least at the King Street entrance, I drove by it the other day and it says sidewalk not maintained. Uh, so, you know, we, that sidewalk is, is signed that it isn't maintained in the winter right now. 
Any further comments or questions, Councillor, or sorry, Deputy Mayor Ross? Thank you, Worship. My heart says yes, it's a great idea. My head says no. Um, I just don't think we open this box that we start to Little Lake and then we say no to Aberdeen or we say no to uh, Bayport. I, I, I think if this is the direction we council choose to go, that I think we need to come up with a plan, bring it in the budget and uh, come up with an actual plan, yes. So I'm, I'm not against the idea, but I'm against the idea today. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further comments or questions? If not, then I, I, I actually, this came up on the mayor's phone call this morning, um, partly because of the conversation with Bayport. And I uh, had some, inkling that Penetang machine had been through this last year and maybe the year before, um, where they had been, they'd had requests to open up a trail and maintain it uh, along the waterfront as a walking path for seniors and just people generally to get out and get some physical activity. The problem they ran into was one of in infilling of the trail fairly quickly because of uh, prevailing winds in certain spots. We're, we're plugging the trail up. But more, more of a concern was that over time, it created a, a ditch or well. And when you had melt activity, then you ended up with a lot of ice and a lot of slip and uh, slip and fall hazard and that sort of thing. It came forward again with COVID and people no longer going to uh, the sunny side of the snowbirds or staying home. They're putting a lot of requests in to do the work and the, the staff in reviewing everything, their experiences to date within Penetang Machine said, oh, we don't think so. The recommendation was no to council. No, it was up to council where they wanted to do it. But some, somebody along the way said, well, what happens if we groom it? So you're not plowing anymore. It's a groom trail for multi-use uh, ski dues as well as pedestrians with signage saying that it's a multi-use trail. And I'm not sure what the outcome was, but I think Penetang Machine is looking to do that in concert with the uh, Snow Riders, Georgian Bay Snow Riders, I think it's called. We're currently in conversation with Georgian Bay. In fact, we have a bylaw that we're gonna look at tonight for them to operate within the boundaries of the town of Midland and groom trails. Um, it's conceivable that they, I think, I don't know whether they groom Little Lake, but they're, they, I think, use Little Lake to access the south side. Perhaps they'd run a groomer. Now, I, Mr. Campbell's probably ready to shoot me at this point, I'm not sure. Uh, but it wouldn't involve his staff or equipment. Uh, it would be just something where you're double, it's either double grooming to get the compaction. And then it's a, sort of a buyer beware. Uh, so uh, they were also, I think, looking at uh, something with uh, being in a, a new home for a groomer at the end of King Street, if I'm not mistaken. So there may be a solution here, which isn't a snowplow, but, uh, and I would, maybe we would like to take the opportunity to talk to the folks in Penetang Machine and see what they say. Uh, did I just put my foot in your mouth, Mr. Campbell? I hope not. Uh, I, you know, it, with the Georgian Bay Snow Riders, uh, they groom a trail, their liability insurance covers that. I, you know, we can certainly have discussions with them, but to, for them to uh, groom a trail that isn't a covered under minimum maintenance standards, uh, again, it's all, all about liability. Uh, and certainly if they groom it, then they might want snowmobiles on it. And I don't know that people want snowmobiles in the Lake Park and on Bayport Trail and things like that. But again, we can, we can have a discussion with them, I'm, I'm not sure how that would go because again, it's also their liability now that we're sure. be dealing with. Thank you. I, I know that they build their, uh, their, their trails, a lot of the trails is multi-use, cross country skiing, hiking, as well as snowmobiles, but you, it's the, the primary impetus for this is uh, snowmobiles. So I, I agree that I doubt anybody wants a snowmobile going down Bayport at three in the morning with the exhaust taken off or something like that. But, uh, it's something, it's a little deviation from the, uh, the motion itself. And I, I tend to agree with the deputy mayor about 
this may not be the time for plowing and all that. Uh, we'll take, we need to take a more holistic view of it, whether it's Bayport or in Aberdeen or Little Lake. But it may be that with Little Lake, uh, you have fewer constraints and they might just say, gee, well, we're down that way, we'll run back and forth twice and go on their merry way, I don't know. So just to fly in the ointment. So with that, um, is there any, if there are no, oh, sorry, Councilor Gordon, beg your pardon. Yes, sir, well, I'd be quite content to amend this motion easily by slapping on, um, you know, after, for a recreational activity, uh, in concert with Georgian Bay snow riders, like, you know, whatever we need to move this forward. I mean, I get that there's people at the Bayport village that want stuff and maybe Aberdeen doesn't. And like, this is motion isn't about that. This is about Little Lake Park. So, and Little Lake Park isn't groomed at all by the snow machines. Uh, people just ride like wherever they want, you know, trying to hit manhole covers like I did, mess your ski up. But uh, having that trail there, that's the only one I'm really concerned about with right now because it's nice and flat and smooth. If we could, talk to them and see if they're willing to, that would be a perfect, you know, uh, compromise. And that's exactly what I was hinting at earlier today when I was talking about the new uh, trail extension between, that's the counties apparently anyway, between Penetang and Midland. So that would be a great compromise. I think it would be awesome. We're good. There's going to be sled noises down there anyway, because didn't we approve the, you know, the sleds running through the lake in the winter? Wasn't there something with, there's some kind of event sled cross or? Yeah, that was last year. Oh, was it okay? Well, so I mean, these things happen anyway, and they're already driving in the park. Um, like, and now there's cars driving through there. So, I it would be awesome if somebody was to wanted to talk to them and see whether they'd entertain that. That might, and I don't even care. This motion can die then, and we can just trust staff to make that conversation. Uh, again, that's one of the reasons why I bring these things up is so we can maybe something happens, maybe it doesn't, right? So, I mean, I'm good with it. But if you want to want to let me modify it, or we can just let it die and Leave it with the staff. Uh, well, we'll put it to a vote as is, and Mr. Campbell knows that we are um, interested in a conversation with snow riders, at least for Little Lake. And there's, uh, I mean, they're asking us to do certain things, and perhaps we should maybe ask them if they would be so kind as to reciprocate, as long as it doesn't create a problem for them. Is that okay with you? Okay, so I'll call then the question on uh, the motion as it stands with the understanding that Mr. Campbell will, or Mr. Barrio, as the case may be, will approach, uh, assuming that this doesn't run us afoul of our own standards, requirements, and so on. So uh, I'll reread the motion that council support the additional snow clearing activities required to open Middle Lake Park waterfront walking trail for recreational activity. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, thank you, against. Uh, that's defeated, Councillor, uh, but I think that uh, we we have a, a path forward, I think, and I think that's what really what you're looking for. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Council. Um, interesting conversation. Oh, beg your pardon, Councillor Prost. I just wanted to remind you of the time. I think we have to pass a motion to go after 11. We do. Um, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Ross. No motion. Let's, we got five minutes. We can get this done. Oh, okay. We can. We can. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's for the attitude I like. Thank you. <laughs> so we have. Um, so I got to read this very quickly. Moved by Councillor Downer, seconded by Councillor uh, Prost. That the following bylaws, bylaw 2020-70 agreement to extend shared fire services agreement with the town of Panitanguishin, bylaw 2020-71 agreement with Georgian Bay Snow Riders Club, bylaw 2020-72 transfer payment agreement for the investing in Canada infrastructure program, brackets ICIP, Public transit stream between Her Majesty the Queen and Right of Ontario, represented by the Minister of Transportation for the Province of Ontario and the Corporation of the Town of Midland, bylaw 2020 73, removal of part lock control on lot 34 within registered plan of subdivision 1508 808 Birchwood Drive, 
Bylaw 2020-74, interim tax levy for 2021, and to provide for penalty and interest. Bylaw 2020-75, easement agreement with William Norman and Marine Norman for the purpose of a storm sewer, sanitary sewer, stormwater outflow ditch, and 1.5 meter wide sidewalk, brackets 319 Gervais Street. Bylaw 2020-76, amendment to bylaw 2019-80, being a bylaw for the imposition of development charges, be passed and enacted. Uh, all those in favor. Thank you, that carries. Next, uh, moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Deputy Mayor Ross, that bylaw 2020-77 being a bylaw to adopt the proceedings to the regular council meeting held on December 9th, 2020, be passed and enacted. Council, you've heard the motion, all in favor? Thank you, that carries. And thanks to Councillor Prost and her can do, let's get her done. Uh, moved by Councillor Downer, seconded by Councillor Cunningham, that this regular meeting of council be held, uh, held rather December 9, 2020, be adjourned at 10.58 p.m. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prost. Happy holidays, everyone. Yes. Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thank you. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Happy.